This week's episode is sponsored by Change. Change is the number one mentoring program that teaches you e-commerce from scratch. Change has a real community with real results. I have been working with Ryan for many years now and have attended many of his events and retreats across the world and got to meet members and the amazing community of like-minded people. Ryan works with a lot of big names in the business world, helping them build online businesses and e-commerce. Change offers personal one-on-one support, no experience needed, but like anything, this takes time and is not a get-rich-quick scheme. If you put the work in, you will get the results. E-commerce and online shopping is getting bigger and bigger. This is a great opportunity for anyone that is looking for financial freedom. For more information, go follow Ryan on Instagram at RyanJB and he will guide you through the steps to help you get started and build a successful online business. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you are notified for when my next podcast goes live. And boom, we're on. Let's go. Yes, bro. And today's guest, we've got Russell Manser. Russell, how are we? Sensational, mate. I did say, being a pleasure, being a big fan of your, what you're doing, brother, been following you for a long time, and it's just an absolute pleasure to get here in sunny uh, Glasgow, Scotland. Yeah, all the way from Oz, bro, all the yeah. way to Scotland. Thank you for that. Yeah, but an amazing story, heart-hitting story, fascinating story. People know this podcast now, there's no shit stories, but your story... One of Australia's most notorious bank robbers went through this, the system, being abused, heroin addict, in and out of prison your whole life. But you're doing amazing things now, which we'll also touch on later on in the podcast. But before we get into everything, though, I always like to go back to the start, brother, get more of an understanding of you, where you grew up, and how it all began. Well, my parents uh, immigrated from Liverpool in 1965, Liverpool, UK, to Liverpool, Australia, or places, would you believe it? I had three brothers and a sister uh, that were born in Liverpool, UK. Me and my brother were born in Liverpool, Australia. So, you know, so diehard Scousers. And um, we, I grew up in what's the housing project, housing commission. It's called Government Subsidised Housing. I grew up there in a five-bar house with a, a specialised roof. And it was like an, an oven through summer, like 45 degrees summer days. And just working class people, you know, factory workers. And they didn't have big dreams they didn't have big dreams which i always did and i was i was had an awareness of as a kid you know i'm the youngest of six five boys one girl and i was always had an awareness that i was i was going to do more i always thought i was going to do something fucking great and i was always slapped and told stop dreaming today people when kids are like that they 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 push it along you know but um back then it was called daydreaming stop daydreaming get real you know what i mean and um so in my area, there was a lot of criminals. We, we there was a high ratio of criminals and Indigenous Aboriginal people, and um, and uh, I gravitated towards those sort of people because they were doing it. They weren't in the struggle. They had the nice cars, the nice girls, the nice clothes, look fit, living the lifestyle. Where I used to see the factory workers, because that's all my area of produce was factory workers. I used to see them up the bus stops looking miserable, you know, in that struggle and I didn't want to be part of that you know and um so I gravitated and I was always hanging around and trying to earwig and trying to find out how we go about this criminal behavior because I was always going to be a criminal that's how I, was. I had a that's, that was my career path I guess what was your mum and dad like really good like um really good there was no domestic violence no alcohol abuse or anything like that just hard working people my dad was a merchant seaman from Liverpool so he was really distant, you know what I mean? He wasn't a great, I am not. I love him, but he wasn't a great communicator. He'd come home from work, read books, wasn't really engaging, you know what I mean? And um, my mum was just the salt of the earth, worked in factory, worked in a, um, a factory of a night time in a plastic factory and, and that sort of stuff, you know? And, and I'd become self-sufficient from a young age. I was cooking for myself and ironing my clothes at five years old, you know? And I, I had to grow up really fast. I had to look after myself really fast and... Um, that served me well later on in life, but I don't think it was ideal. You know what I mean? It was like it wasn't. There wasn't a lot of engagement or anything. I don't. Man, my parents just done their best. I love them from what you know, but they 
my down by the distance. Mm-hmm. What were you like at school? I know you were a daydreamer and stuff. Yeah, yeah. I was, were you not a kid? I was, yeah, I was. I was very disruptive. You know what I mean? I was, I was, see, I was an attention, with the benefit of hindsight now, I was an attention, I was what you'd be called, you'd call an attention seeking sort of a kid, you know, and I wanted validation. You know, and I wanted to, because I didn't like troubled kids seek validation if they're not getting it at home they'll find it somewhere else and I, and I think the indicators were there from an early stage that I was going to be a troubled kid mm-hmm. do you think that your dad not being there full time plays a big part in that kind of yeah. attention seeking 100% I think it's really the roles of, of fathers are just so underestimated the roles of I was watching I was on the plane coming over and I was watching these you know I, 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 I like how the, the, the Arabs do it with their kids. You know, the father grabs that kid at a certain age and really takes him on. But I was watching this this guy's interaction and I thought, man, I yearn that as a kid, you know what I mean? A lot of, like my family, Australia's a lot of rope. They, you either play rugby rugby league, you don't play rugby league or AFL, you're sort of an outsider. And my family were all soccer players, you know. It's not our national game over there, you know what I mean? And and I was good at rugby league and they there was, my brother was really good at soccer so all the attention was onto him. I'm not, you know, I, I I love my parents. You know, but um, the parent that was more so. If you didn't play soccer, well, we well, have got no interest in rugby league. You know, I think discipline is massive, massive. for kids nowadays. And hundred percent, I think it's getting took away where there's no discipline. Like yeah. kids are little fuckers. Let's be honest. They're, for sure, they'll test and test and test. They're not daft either. Yeah, but some discipline to understand this is right, this is wrong, and structure. And, yeah, and it's important. And no matter if you can teach them right and wrong, I think the natural human being knows right from wrong anyway. Yeah. But we like to test the boundaries. Mm. And if there's no parents there, if there's only one parent there, you can push the boundaries as much run, as you can. Run rings around them. So one of the common denominators I've done, like I've worked out through my own stuff, is kids that are involved in either team sports or martial arts, boxing or whatever, you know, they get that discipline, that structure. It's so important for kids to be involved in that sort of stuff. I think creating structure from a young age. Now, my structure was just get up cook myself some eggs, get dressed and go to school, walk myself to school, you know, from a young age. But, um, you know, I found my validation. I found my tribe in criminals. You know, I found I was told, you know, I was one of those kids that was told I was good at it, you know. And I remember, it was funny, but recently what happened was um, I used to go to the shops and the, the bank robbers would pull up in their flash cars and everything like that and have the, the lower denominator notes, like the $1 and $2 notes, the and that's how, yeah, yeah, Ron Russell, yeah, mate, give you these. And that left a massive impression on me. Like, I, it was like, I was like, um, Sonny in, in, in um, the Bronx Tale. They were, it was them, them sort of idle type things, you know. And those sort of blokes, I used to think, fuck, I'm going to be like that one day. And I, 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 I just I'd get a bit ahead of myself. Recently, I, I used to do it when I was robbing banks. I, I used to give five and ten dollar notes to these kids. And one kid recently pulled me up and he's a billionaire now. And he gave me a, um, a Brantling, a, a diamond encrusted Brantling watch. He said, "I'll never forget your generosity to me and my family when, when I was young." And he gave me a Brantling watch just at Christmas. So it was that tradition I carried on when I become a bank robber. I'm getting a bit. Of, I'll get back to it. But when I become a bank robber, I carried on that tradition and it paid dividends for me. So yeah, mm. you know, my I started getting into trouble stealing cars and that sort of stuff. And um, back then, they never had like. Today in Australia, they've got a lot of diversion programs. They don't want to send kids. They don't want to lock kids up. And my first time, I got locked up, and I went. I got sent to a boys' home. What age? Fifteen. And um, I was fifteen years old. And um, and there was a boys' home called Derrick Boys' Home in the western suburbs of Sydney. And it was, there was fucking prolific sexual and physical abuse taking place there. And I didn't escape that, you know. And I think it was government sanction, and there was definitely pedophile rings running out of there because a lot of the abusers didn't. We didn't even. We'd never seen them working there. They were there overnight time. There was like people coming into the boys' homes and sexually abusing a lot of. You didn't escape it. It was just a rite of passage that you, you, everyone was going to get sexually abused. So, and I, and I think it was government sanctioned back then. And it was funny about that that whole story because what I left there. I, look, I left. The, I went there a happy sort of go lucky kid, and left pretty damaged after it. With a void, I never. I've never, I've, I've never smoked cigarettes, right? I never smoked because my dad had emphysema, and I just thought, "Fuck, well, that'd be a horrible way to die," you know. And um, so I never smoked pot or anything like that, and I never had any drug issues. And that, but when I, I was sexually abused in Derek the second night I was there by three staff members, and um, you try to report it, and you just shut your mouth; it'll, it makes it worse for you. But that whole 
that whole thing, 60 minutes is a, I don't know if you've got that over here, yeah. but, but 60 minutes got involved. I've got it here, but I've watched the 60 minutes are good. Yeah, yeah. Well, the 60 minutes got involved. It's a current affair program. They get involved and that's when people get charged. But they hadn't known that thing had been on there for years. It was everyone, every, like so many kids had talked about what had happened on them. And it starts to become this common denominator, like of sociopathic and psychopathic behaviour, people that go on to commit some pretty, pretty serious mur- murders. And when they backtrack it, the common denominator was Derek Boyzone or Tamworth Boyzone. And the, there's correlations drawn between the abuse that took place and the murderous behaviour that these people go on to commit because they're, they're robbed, they're, you know, no empathy and compassion or is demonstrated, given to these kids and they go on to fucking be fucking psychopaths. Yeah, so you can take a beating. Any man can take a beating. Any, even a kid, you can take a beating. But it's when it goes into the soul. It's when the sexual abuse and the mental abuse is a different mm. ball game. Different. Or getting an arm broke or a leg broke. I had an amazing woman on Barbara O'Hare. Mm. She was in Aston Hall. What happens is you talk about paedophile rings. Paedophile rings. They would target kids who are lost, kids mm. coming from addiction, kids coming from a broken home, mm. take them to Aston Hall and sign them off as crazy. Yeah. So when the kids did report it, they were getting abused off these men. Men used to men used to show up in suits and Rolls Royces mm. and Bentleys, take kids, pick them, take them away and bring them back hours later. This woman was reporting this and everybody called her crazy and told her to go back. Kids were escaping, running to the police station, kids as young as seven, eight, nine, running to the police station, the police would take them straight back to the hospital because it was in they were crazy and they, they were allowed like fantasists yeah and it was all true so they had a checklist of the kids who nobody would believe they people don't realize how prolific it is worldwide people don't realize how and how damaging we just had one of the cardinals and the cardinal george pell he was second in charge in the vatican as far that he wrote a thing called the melbourne response and it was a blueprint for how to cover up the evil deeds of pedophiles, oh, this you move the you move the priest here, you move him there. If you got he's a little slush fund, you can pull a bit of money out of here to pay for it, to give him the silence and that sort of stuff. But people don't real the damage it done. I you know I end up in them boys homes. Well, well I you know I, I I got out of that boys home within twelve months. But but part of what I learned that boys home was also a college, so I didn't get rehabilitated. I learned how to steal Porsches. So um, I stole a Porsche one night from an affluent area and got in a police chase. It was the first time they ever used helicopters in Australia to chase a fucking stolen car. And it was on me. And um, they, anyway, they tracked us down. And um, anyway, I went before a children's court at the age of 16. And um, the judge said, how dare a boy from a, a poor area, being where I was from, come to an affluent area and steal a Porsche? And I didn't think it was a crime to be from a poor area. And he said, I'm going to sentence you to 12 months. And I stipulate it gets served in an adult prison. And I, I thought it was all bullshit. Anyway, we're in, we're in this fucking police car. We're going out to Long Bay Prison, which is a maximum security prison in Sydney. And I was saying to my mate, I don't, I don't, mate well, it looks like we're going there. And then when we got there, they strip searches and and um, these prison officers were part of it all. And they, they housed us in one wing protection wing was the most, that housed the worst prolific sex offenders in the country at the time. And they thought it was for our protection to house us with them. And that night they housed me with two convicted pedophiles and put me three... They put me on a mattress mattress on the floor, sexually abused. And people go, oh, I would have bit his dick off. I would have done that. It doesn't go like that, mate. When you're fucking knocked out cold, when someone gets behind you, chokes you out, and you wake up, it doesn't go like that. It doesn't go down like people go, oh, I would have fought to the death. You don't get a chance to fight for the death sometimes. You don't get a fucking say in it. You're knocked out cold, and this is what happens. They're, they're fucking, you're talking about manipulative fucking bull, you know, and often violent fucking animals. You know what I mean? I'm a... 16 year old kid and i wasn't big for my age i would have been 45 kilos up against 200 kilo plus men i didn't stand a chance and um when them officers put me in that cell at night they made a joke of it to them blokes they said have fun boys so you know what i mean like that's what they said to the the two abusers and and the next day i was abused by a negrophiliac a negrophiliac is a person that has sex with dead bodies and i was introduced to heroin and and i found nirvana i just found when i had my first shot of heroin I thought, fuck, where's this been? Like, I, that void and that emptiness that the abuse causes, it just fills it straight up. It just gives you this your, a feeling of euphoria. You didn't give a fuck how many times you got abused. You felt nothing. You just felt that euphoria from the drug, and I was I was gone. I was gone from that moment. I loved it the moment I had it, you know, and I fell in love with it for a long, long time, and I 
took me a long time to, to to break it. You know, I got out of I got out of that jail. I'd done eight months on that. Got out of that jail and I had a taste from heroin because they tell you where you can get it. These are the suburbs you can get it, and this is how you go about getting it. And um, and I was using heroin every day, every every day. And at, at the age of eighteen, I got pinched for breaking into some department stores and got sentenced to eleven years. And uh, but this time I went to a mainstream prison. This episode is sponsored by Fire Away Pizza, the fastest growing pizza company in the UK with over 150 stores. With their fresh quality ingredients and unique pizzas, they will have you coming back for more. Use code JAMES20 for 20% off. That's JAMES20 for 20% off. Where I should have went the first place, I would have been weight protected. I wouldn't have been. I think you you guys call them nonces over here. Yeah, we call them rock spiders. You know, no rock spiders. The one in in reference to sex, sex, uh, child sex pedophiles. That we call them rock spiders. You can't get lower than a rock spider. What's a rock spider? That's a pedophile. Is that? What's that mean though? You can't get lower than a rock spider. Rock spiders live under rocks. Rocks, Yeah, Yeah, you can't get lower than them. How is that though? Going through that young innocent kid, not innocent, stealing cars, it's not that to then being treated as a piece of meat to then be getting thrown into some of the most yeah. ugliest, evilest men on the planet. Like, how do you feel well, that was, now, years later? Oh, angry, angry. Because, you know, I've got, you know, I, I remember watching my kids go through, I've got two boys, I was watching them go from that age, and I was looking at, and like, especially my youngest son, I was thinking, fuck, man, like, he's, he's him and I are very similar. I was thinking, fuck, how could they allow that? How, how could that allow that? And it just gave me really, and yeah, I, I, man, I filled with rage, to be quite honest, you know what I mean? And But at the time, you just felt fucking so, like, there's this void in you. It's really hard to explain it. And it's like this. there's this real emptiness inside you, and, you know, you're carrying on. I talk about it with the work I do today. I'm carrying a, a fucking backpack of shit that don't belong to me, and that's fucking, you know, shame and embarrassment and, and yeah, because there's a lot of things that people don't know about. When 75% of males, 75% of male sex uh, uh, abuse survivors had an erection when they were abused, and that fucks with your head really bad because in your head you're saying, I must have liked it. You're telling yourself the, the, the narrative in your head, I must be gay, I must have liked it. I'm definitely not gay. I'm, you know, not, you know. That I'm definitely not gay, but that, that that was a real challenging thing in my head for a really long time. That sexuality stuff, that was the fucking stuff that fucked with my head the worst. It was like torture, you know. And um, and you and and then why? And it was always a matter of why did they pick me? Well, they fucking back in the boys' zone, they picked everyone. But your head still says, why did they pick me? Why didn't I bite his dick off? Why didn't I pick something and stab? Something? You know what I mean? All this why, 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 and all this regret, you know. That's the worst thing about it. That was the fucking torture. Because the people I've had on, it's the blame of blaming themselves. Did I lead them on? Yeah. Did I get her on? Um, Della Wright, six yeah. years old. Yeah. This guy used to get her to dance around in her pants and stuff like that. And she was thinking, was I leading it on by doing that? But you're a kid, you don't think of that stuff. And it's hard to then try and give the, the right information to then try and tell people how strong they are to be speaking out about it because I've had men on who's bottled it up for 30 years mm. 30 years one in every four get mine abused mine was 35 mine was about 35 yeah. years before I talked about it one in every four get abused yeah and there's only I was it over like only under 40% or 30% actually speak about it yeah because they just bury it but yeah. what does that do to the soul to the mind to everything that you're going through to then because you were just going stealing cars how then does that then take your life to a totally different direction? Do you think you would have always been that crazy or do you think that just totally ripped your fucking soul out where you thought it's just every day's it, survival? It created an emptiness in me that I, I think the car stealing and that maybe I would have, you know, because I, I was always a kid, I was always a kid that, you know, I didn't mind working. I didn't, I've always had a good work ethic. If you give me a job, I'll, oh man, I will never let you down. I'll work my ass off. And that, I think the car stealing thing would have been a bit, but when you bring heroin into the equation and you've got a reliance on heroin, that's a whole different ball game. Once that once that's in the game, there's you're you're destined for a lifelong lifelong time in prison, you know. And um See the guys, how many people were in this wing? In that one, hundred and twenty. How many kids? Ten. What kids getting brought in for these people? Oh no, no, it's in it's in the boys' yeah, home. In the boys' home there was forty six in every dormitory. 
46 in every dormitory. And there was, was four, that, four dormitories. Was that for the kid getting abused? 100%. 100%. Was that for by their pedophile? Um, I think, you know, with, with the benefit of hindsight, we've looking back on some of that, I think some of them, I think it was, they were indoctrinated. They had to play, take part of it. I think there was a lot of pedophiles in it. And I think, and, and some of them, I, I thought, this bloke ain't doing this for sexual gratification. He's doing it to teach me as, as a punishment tool. I used to think there was a bit different than, there was two different types. The ones the ones that were coming in were definite real sicko fucking pedophiles. But but they were allowing they were allowing kids to be taken out. Like you talk about that woman in Rolls Royces and everything like that. They were allowing that. They were, kids were getting taken out. And a bloke later got pinched for negro uh, killing uh, a young boy. And he was there every weekend taking different kids out. So, you know, I just, all the staff were involved in it. And they used to have these women, old matrons, old women. And they come in to do the clothes, make sure you had clothes and sheets and everything like that. And they knew what was all going on. And and I remember once talking to one of them, like I thought she was like a grandma type. And I said, well, you know, these blokes are doing that. She goes, oh, don't you, you seem like a nice young kid, Russell. But she goes, but you're like the rest of them. You're just a liar. She just was so nonchalant that that wasn't happening. And it would have been told to her a heap of times that, you know, there was so much abuse. That's sad. The young kid, 12, 13, 14, being abused, trying to reach out to somebody. That's why a lot of people stay quiet. Yeah. Because they're getting totally shut up. And that's the heartbreaking thing. See, when you went to the adult prison with the, the sex cases and the nonces mm. and the protection, how many young kids were in there? When I got to Long Bay Prison, there was 12. There was 12. But I was different than them, right? Because in, under the legislation, I, I shouldn't have been there. I was totally illegal to send me there. They, there was other kids there, and they were there for because they continually escaped from the boys' home. I hadn't escaped from a boys' home. Like, I, I ran away once, but I handed myself in. But... um. But um, but the ones that were involved in riotous behaviours and kept them escaping and escaping, so they sent them to the jail to teach them a lesson. There was that, but I wasn't one of them. But they were all getting sexually abused, and some of them, like I remember talking to this professor from Wollongong University, come and see me, and he goes, "You know, out of all them kids, you're doing a small sentence." And I said, "Why is that?" He goes, "I've done some research on it." He said, "You know, there's, you know, a lot of them kids out of the, the twelve of us that end up getting really big fucking sentences for murder." Um, serious crimes and that sort of doing 28 years and stuff like that and mine was I was doing 15 years at the time I was doing 15 years with a non pro period of 8 years and he said yours would be the smallest you know and that but they still weren't asking us a question we um you know I got out of jail in 1989 28th of June very intention man I'd just done my apprenticeship when I went back to jail I gravitate like in prison the bank robbers hang around the bank robbers, the drug smugglers hang around the drug smugglers, the people who do break car thieves, everyone's, everyone's, you know, water finds its own level and I just gravitate them bank robbers and I just pick their brains and I just go, you know, and some of them were pretty willing to tell you how to go about it, you know. But I I remember one old bank robber, Ray Johnson, he was an old farmer and he lost his farm and he went out robbing banks to square up on the banks, you know. And I said to him, Ray, how do I go robbing these banks? He goes, well, you get a job on the council. I'm like, hey, I might use the council truck to to fucking sit off and surveillance he goes you just don't do them he said because it's a lonely old life of a bank robber and then fucking words echoed in my head for years like i just echoed like i could sit in a cell of a night time and hear that and he fucking haunted me with that bit of knowledge you know but a lot of blokes you know i was pretty blessed with some of the blokes that told me they said mate when you rob banks don't make people panic go in keep them calm as possible and that was my style. I was known as the gentleman bank robber, you know, because I didn't make people panic. I was, look, bank robberies are traumatic, you know, whether whether you're a fucking gentleman or you're not a gentleman. I, and I accept that. And I accept from my learning about my own trauma, the trauma I caused on other people. But um, I remember robbing my first bank. It was the Commonwealth Bank at Cordon in an affluent area again. And I, I love the affluent areas. God bless some great contributors. And... Um, and I walked in and I had a knife and I, I, the knife cost me four bucks from Salvation Army and I was like, better than crypto. So for my $4 knife, I got a $20,000 return, you know. And, um, and I went in and and I'd done the bank and, um, you know, I was very, you know, like, I'm not here to hurt no one. Just give me the money and it's not your money and I apologised on the way out and fucking, and, and that was the beginning of the bank run. I just loved them. I fucking loved the thrill of them and, Back then, we had a really bad rogue cop. Back then, it was killing bank robbers. He was, that was his. I think he was given the job by the government to start knocking them because the you know. 
and he was going around killing blokes coming out of banks. So that thrill of rocking out of a bank, no, because I had a death wish, you know what I mean? I, from the abuse, I had a death wish. I didn't give a fuck if I lived or died. I'd made peace with death. And I, 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 was, I was with that for a very, very long time, you know. When I used to use heroin, I used to overdose a lot because I was living on the precipice of death because that's where comfort laid. Who gave you the heroin first time? Well, uh, the, the bloke who was a necrophiliac in, in prison. One of the abusers? Yeah, one of the abusers. Was that part of the plan, though? Yeah. Yeah, addicted so as you come back? No, I, was, I think it, the part of it was to keep me silent because he was like, a, he was like, he was a bloke that worked in morgues and he was having sex with dead bodies and that. And he weren't really criminal minded and everything like that, but he had access to corrupt prison officers and everything like that. And he, and, um, so he just said, mate, give this a go. He said, you, you seem real sad. Cause I was, I was pretty emotional. I was fucking, it was pretty easy to see. I wasn't myself. And I, I fucking had a shot of heroin and I, heroin makes me vomit. And the first time I had had a shot of heroin, I was over the toilet fucking vomiting and he took advantage and fucking sexually abused me while I was vomiting in the toilet. Um, but um, and I fucking love that feeling. I loved it for a long time. I just chased that. Because this first shot you ever have of heroin, there'll never be one again like it. There'll never, but you'll chase that feeling forever and ever and ever a day. And, and I know like the trigger people, but you know, it's, it's, it's just one of those things that was my comfort, you know. And um, I, I, I went, I got out of prison. I, my family, my family are, are law abiding citizens. They rallied around me, tried to keep me out of trouble, get me an apprenticeship with my brother as an electrician. And they weren't for me. That was never for me. I just, I was chasing the thrill of action. And I didn't want to be this fucking battler, you know. By the time I was full scale robbing one or two banks a week. Um, and that's what I did. I, I'd, made, I have, I'd have a hundred grand in the roof of my house. I'd still go out robbing them. Because I fucking, I, you know, and people say, what did you do? I said, because I fucking loved it. I loved the fact that fucking I wasn't in the struggle anymore. I could do and go whatever I wanted. I remember going to Surface Paradise to withdraw from heroin because my habit was getting a lot done. So I'd go and, go and book in a five-star hotel, go and lay in the sun all day on the beach, you know what I mean? And I met these girls and I stayed up there for about two weeks and I blew 70 grand in two weeks. In 1990, it's like fucking 200 now. And then I said, oh, I've got to go. I, was, I went back and I got my mate to pick me up at the airport in a stolen car. We went and robbed the bank near the airport. Went back up and... Um, just party with these girls, and I was fucking. I thought I was having a time of life. I was still using heroin, but you know, I went back in Sydney, got some heroin, took it up there. Man, and you know, I was just so careless. I didn't give a fuck. I just did not give a fuck, you know. And but I, you know, what happened was I ended up getting pinched for fang, five bank robberies, and I came across fucking heavy duty coppers. And their mum hold up squad coppers in Australia. They are fucking proper G's. They're proper gangsters, you know. They want to, they want to catch you robbing a bank so they can get their money off you and rob you, and that's what happened. So. They rock up and they said, where's your money? And I said, I haven't got none. They fucking went and found 30 grand in my roof cavity. Split up there, drinking my beers, fucking divvying up my fucking, anything that was any value. You're going, yeah, I haven't that. You got that off the last job. And anyway, so I got pinched for five bank robbers. And at the time I was going out with a school teacher and I, they, I, they never had me on anything. And they said, you're going to admit to three of these bank robberies or we're going to charge a girl with accessory after the fact. And I just bought her a nice car, and she was first year school teacher, and she had nothing to do with it. So I didn't want her to get fucked over, and so I signed myself up for free. And then I said, "Fuck this!" And then, but this feeling when I, I woke up in the cells the next day, I withdrew from heroin. I got a big bile of fucking big spew of vial next to me from the fucking withdrawing, and I look over and there's these fucking charge sheets, fucking three arm robberies. Like hit me like a ton of bricks like that just took my breath away i said i ain't doing this i ain't fucking doing this either going to be suicide or escape you know so um went to jail and i come across this old XA soldier and i told him what i wanted to do i said i want to go to court and have a crack i want to have a try escape and he goes yeah sweet sweet and then we're doing fireman drills carrying blokes up and down had a couple of blokes coming to court with me that day and um then the piece of resistance and he said i've got a master stroke for you he said, walk up to someone and throw a handful of salt in their eyes and see what they do. So I just walked up this bike for a handful of salt. And the first thing he done was cover his eyes up and fuck, what the fuck? Because you don't know if it's bleach or it's acid or whatever it is. Then I shook his hand and apologised. I said, mate, I'm, I'm going to escape. I'm just, he goes, oh, and everyone's a will off. No worries, mate. You know, everyone's forgiving, you know what I mean? Because everyone wants to help you. 
And then, um, and back in the day, everyone had handcuff keys. So you jump in the truck and make them out of fucking dustpans, steel dustpans. So you jump in the truck, pull your handcuff key out your mouth, take your handcuffs off. As we come off the back of the van, fucking bang, crack the copper, handful of salt in his eyes. He drops it fucking and bang, ran, got out. And um, off we went and we're on. Well, three of us got away. And um, one bloke who, who came with us that day, he was going to be doing fucking like three months. He ended up doing 10 years because he was fucking fucked up. I did the for the sort of guy who was doing three. Why did he go? He just, just for the buzz of it? He couldn't help himself, you know. Bobby Hayes got to love him. And, um, yeah, so um, that's funny, you know. Anyway, someone from our drill, my area was meant to park a car there. The car wasn't there. So this bloke's painting his house. I says, is that your car? I've got handcuffed hanging off. And he's realised, whoa, fuck. And the thing's got everything, club locks, kill switches, and they're the biggest bomb in the area. And I said, man, I'll leave some money for you in the car. Anyway, he starts the car for us and gets us going. That night, he's on the news with a fucking neck brace on and interpreter saying, they punched me, they've kicked me, I was scared for my life. He was fucking helping us, you know, it's just funny. But anyway, went to my area. In my area, people just love a crim, you know. So the first door we knocked on, they said, geez, you took your time getting here. And a woman said, I'm just cooking a roast for you. And th that expectation was we're turning up and they're going to look after us. And, um, and, and you know, and it was just, and then people are just such beautiful, like the any fucking, any, any authority. They're just, I was the good guy and the rest were the bad guy, you know. And, and, I, and, and, and a lot of people knew what took place in them boys' homes too. Because a lot of them they had members of their families that had come out and watched it happen too. And so I was the good guy and, um, you know, had a feed and put an order on. I need some guns, some balaclavas. An hour later, a bag, the door getting knocked on the door, opened the door as a bag. It's got balaclavas and guns and some stuff to steal cars with, and we're on. So I went back and robbed the National Australia Bank that I robbed before I was on remand for, and it was like a Vietnamese security guard, and I'd taken his gun off him before, and he goes, oh, not again. It was Christmas time. It was 15th of December, 1990. I said, nah, it's all right, man. I said, I'll give you a reference. I'm just sitting there talking to him while my mate's over the counter getting the money. And uh, and I, I took a 32 Browning off him, seven shot 32 Browning off him. And as I was going, I said, here, mate. I handed him his gun. He's looking at me. I'm looking at him. I said, Merry Christmas. That way you lose your job. And he's looking at me. I'll see him. My mate's going, what the fuck are you doing? And I, and I just hit a ran, you know. Um, yeah, so off we went. We went a bit of a tour of Australia. <laughs> and... Um, and uh, we started running out of money up in Darwin. Darwin's like fucking in the middle of nowhere. It's in the middle of 3,000, 4,000 Ks from Sydney, but it's in the middle of a population of 70,000. First night in this town, my mate comes up and goes, I met Tammy. Tammy works in the bank. Isn't she beautiful? She was fucking ugly ass. I said, Tammy's gorgeous. Tammy's gorgeous. And she told us all about the bank. So we, we robbed the bank up there in Darwin, and, and that just went wrong because... Everyone knew everyone. We stole this car. It was the only yellow car in the whole of the fucking state. And everyone, some TV personalities' cars. So everyone, when we're in the car, everyone's noticing us in it and waving at us. Anyway, my mate got dragged off a plane the next day, and I watched him get dragged off a plane. And so I jumped on this bus, three thousand k bus ride. You, you know, in Europe, you you guys are so lucky. It's everything's everything's fucking days in Australia. <laughs> to get from one place to another, everything's a day or something. Anyway, so I'm on this bus, and um. I'm realising I look red hot. I've got no luggage with me. So overnight we stopped this place and they've got fucking a Cobra hat with fucking cork. Them Aussie fucking things with corks. And I, I Love Australia t-shirt. And there was a pair, a pair of second-hand hiking boots. The bus driver's socks. So I've done my best to look like a tourist, you know. Anyway, the next day we get into Alice Springs, which is fucking out in the middle, mate. It's like dead middle of Australia. And Australia's a big place. Anyway, these coppers all jump over on me and I'm saying, what are you doing? What? Get off me again. They're going, Russell Manch, you were under arrest. I said, what are you doing? I said, my name is fucking Hans. I'm from Sweden. And I'm looking at this girl who's like a backpacker. I'm saying, Helga, Helga, call the embassy. I'm being attacked. And these coppers start panicking. They're thinking there's some diplomatic incident. And um, this whole copper walks over to me. And I, he ended up being a really good guy. And, uh, and his name was Les Smith. He was a boxing trainer. He goes, okay, Hans from Sweden. He goes, if you haven't got a tattoo on your shoulder, blood, he goes, you're going on your backpack away. And he lifted up my shirt and he goes, game's over, Russell. And I said, I'm just, I said, God loves a try, right? And he goes, yeah, nice try. He said, they'll be falling for it. And, um, but I'd done some really fucking hard jail up there in the Northern Territory because they're rednecks. They're the fucking rednecks of the world up there in the Northern Territory. And 
and they seen me as a city slicker that I had to teach a lesson to. And, and um, they gave me a few good offers. They said, we'll have one-on-one fights with you. And they would have like a riot squad. And I, mate, and I was that bored. I'd fucking take it on all day. Yes, we not a problem. So I spent nine months basically in a black hole in segregation because they were just doing sh- like trying to set me up, fucking get me to pick up other people's rubbish and shit like that. And I, I don't do that. I said, I'm not a fucking idiot. I said, get them to pick their own rubbish. I'm not picking up. I just didn't play by their rules. I never was. And after the abuse in the boys' homes and that, I realised they were the enemy and I just didn't take their shit. You know, and I'd punch on with them all the time and um, and I was dirty on them. But um, So they put me in this segregation, like fucking hard jail. Like we talk of some of the world, but that was really hard. Like I was in this cell and it was like 40 degrees out day, all, outside all day and the sun would beat down on this cell all day on a fucking pre- prefabricated concrete wall. And it was like 60 or 80 degrees in there. So fucking hot. So I'd just stretch all day, do sit-ups. And, um, and then when the door come open to punch on, we are just out like a caged animal. Like, and sometimes, you know, I was winning a few and then they just got better, you know. And um, then I had like this thing and I said, one day I said, these cunts are getting too much fucking joy out of this. I'm allowing them blokes to have fucking too much joy out of my misery. It was like a form of abuse in itself, you know. So um, so I just said, I'm not doing this anymore. They said, you quit. I said, no, I'm not quitting. I'm just having it in me to say I quit. And I just said, no, I'm just not doing it anymore. I'm just not letting you get your rocks off because you're just getting your rocks off out of it. Anyway, I think that built a lot of resilience, that nine months in just complete darkness. Like when I say that, it wasn't a pencil, it wasn't a piece of paper. I got out in a little yard for an hour of exercise a day, but I was in darkness and fucking extreme heat. I was like in a sauna for nine months. I went in there, 94 kilos, came out 76. And, but I had abs, and so I looked okay. And, um, and, um, but I think that built something in me, that some resilience, you know. And, I, and, I, never, and I, you know, I got out of, I ended up going back to New South Wales. I ended up doing eight years on that one. And I was fucking clean. I was really clean. I'd, I'd done a lot of work on myself. When I got out of, when I got moved out of that state, I started doing some NA meetings and stuff like that. What made you want to change? I was in enough pain. I was in enough pain. But I, I, I got more. I, I think I got clean out of a resentment. Like I just fucking, I just don't want to give them bastards no more joy. They were getting so much joy out of my misery. And I stayed clean for a long time. I, I got out of jail. I, I met a girl. We started our own marketing and advertising business. Had a couple of kids. It was one of my kids to grow up on the beach. I bought a beautiful home right on the water in Karama on the Gold Coast. And, but I still hadn't done with the abuse. I still never, I was festering sore that never thing. And I, you know, and it started for me. I started, I got back on it by just having a drink, you know. I'm that type of guy that's either all or nothing. And um, started having a drink, started sniffing coke, and then started using again. And ended up back in jail for 10 years. I, I just couldn't get it right again. But Julia Gillard was our, our Prime Minister and she brought a thing in over there that's life-changing for so many people. It's called the Royal Commission of Institutional uh, Responses to Child Sexual Abuse. And there were so many politicians against that. There were so many politicians for not... But she pushed it and she ended up losing a, a Prime Ministership over it, but she pushed it, got it through. And um, so my story was... I robbed the bank on the Gold Coast and fucking, I didn't give a fuck. I wasn't, uh, I, I wasn't wearing balaclavas. I just didn't care. And I'd come out and I was attacked by, tackled by some super citizens, you know, the, the good citizens. And this is where my life changed. And one of them just got me in a choker hold. He said, I just saved your life. And I went, and I didn't understand it at the time. And I went back to the prison. I had, in, I had a game plan. The game plan was to knock myself. The game plan was get a coaxial cable for the TV and knock myself. I got the cell that night. It wasn't there. The next day, a bloke come to my prison window and he said, oh, a bloke I suspected of being a sex offender and it wasn't confirmed at the time, but later confirmed. And he said, mate, here's a shot. I know you've never liked me. And I, was, I looked at him and I banged that window and I said, no matter how bad I was going, no matter how fucked my life was, I couldn't take anything off you. I said, just get away from me. I went out that day, I went out and there was a young bloke he got all his books studying. I said, what are you doing? He said, studying the best psychologist. He said, I took your fucking advice all those years ago and dosed up on my brain. And he looked me up and down with disdain and said, maybe you should take some of your own. And, I thought, oh. and my mate's a lawyer. My mate called me out. He goes, I think I can get you a good result. 
And he asked, what do you reckon? He said, maybe four years, you do four years. Would you be happy with that? And I said, yeah, sweet. So this is when the universe starts working on me, right? So that night, by the, because I've got a bit of status, there's a TV in my cell, there's writing pads, there's food, there's toiletries and that, and the boys have decked my cell out for me. And um, flick on the TV, and the first thing is, I'm on these current affair programs, they've got a, a story about the Royal Commission Institutional Response. They said, have you been affected by abuse? Please contact us. And I wrote down the address and that. And I was writing, and there's a writing paper. I was looking at me and I was like, this war between me and this writing paper. And I, first time I ever wrote my story, I wrote it for one page of what had happened to me. And I put it in this envelope. And the next day, there's like a mailbox where you put your mail in and it gets posted out. And it was throwing the towel in. It was the first time in my life I threw the towel in. I stood there for 15 minutes going, mm, mm, mm. and I knew if I dropped that letter, things were going to change. And, uh, and and it did. I dropped that letter, and I and, and be, be, but but I'd sort of forgotten about it. And then one day I get caught up to a legal visit in jail, and a woman I don't remember her name. She said, um, "We're from the Royal Commission of, of Institutions of Response to Child Sexual Abuse." And the first thing she said to me, that brought me to my knees, and she said, "We believe you." And I went, "What?" She said, "We believe you. We believe what happened. We know what happened to you." And I said, "What are you saying?" And I asked her five times, and she realised what I was doing because. I just couldn't believe someone was saying that. And uh, that's when it all began. That's when that's when the healing began for me. Like straight away I told my story and what happened and how I went about it and how I tried reporting it. But the, the most prolific thing after that was after I'd spoken to them for about an hour and a half, they put me straight in on trauma counselling. And that's when the magic happened for me. I don't I worked with her for like four years, that woman. And I never knew. I, I used to vision what she'd look like. Sometimes she'd be big, fat, and ugly. And sometimes she was just a skinny old grandmother. But we talked over the phone for many years on a regular basis. And um, and then what happened was, in, in, in when you're in a prison yard in Australia, there's two phones in the yard. And everyone knows. Everyone knows fucking, fucking James's fucking son scored four goals at the soccer on a weekend. You know, or fucking a daughter kicked for whatever. Everyone knows what's... And I'm talking to this Royal Commission, and some of them terminologies you're talking in could sound like you're talking to the police. And then I seen a bit of, like you pick up on on, on, on the vibration of the yard, and, and I seen a few blokes whispering and pork, and, and you know, doing, when that's when someone's doing this thing, it's in reference to coppers or police, and they were thinking I was talking to the coppers on the phone. So I had to call the yard meeting, and I had 60 blokes, and I said, listen, I was only talking to coppers about anything i said i'm talking to the royal commission about the abuse that happened to me i said i don't like many of you blokes i don't want to live the rest of my life i want to break this cycle and um fucking 60 blokes clap my oh, fucking wow how strong how powerful was that and um and that's when just and then i just realized i had my purpose and in that period of time before i left that jail about 68 blokes told me their story about the abuse that happened to them and then I just realized that this is what my purpose and calling was in life. I, I was a person in a position where these people felt comfortable talking to me. And that's when my business was formed. You know, I, and it wasn't over for me yet. I still, I, I got transferred to another state. I had two weeks to go. Coppers turned up with six old bank robberies for me as I was about to go out. But, you know, lucky I had lawyers and the judge seen through their bullshit. You know what I mean? That, And I don't... I question whether that was because I was talking about what had happened to me, if they were trying to slow me up or not. I question that at the time. I'm not. I'm still not sure if that's what it was. But I got out. Um, in that time, I met a girl who was a bar- There was a girl. They give me a girl to uh, act as uh, as a lawyer for me for this royal commission stuff. And I tell you, I was sitting in the legal box, and there's like a TV screen, and here she is, and I'm and she like, and I said, "You're oh, fucking beautiful," and she went off ahead at me. She went, you're not allowed to talk to me like that. I'm your fucking lawyer. Rah, rah, rah. And I sent a little smirk on her face. And I went, I've got you. I said, you're it. And, um, and um, you know, long story short, she ended up being my partner for like five years. She was a barrister. She ended up leaving that job and becoming a criminal barrister. And I've been a partner for five years. But I got out of jail. I had to go to rehab. I, 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 at four years clean, I put myself in rehab. Because I just... I, I, I not just only had a drug problem, I had a living problem, I had to learn how to live. You know, I had to put my, dip my foot in the bath. It was my choice to go to rehab, put myself in a rehab for four months, stayed in a rehab outreach program for 12 months, got out, 
was for my business, you know, when I started. So my business is someone comes to me, they tell me they're abused. We interview them, What do what's called a statement of facts. We pass it over to the lawyers and then we support them through the whole process so they can sue, sue the abusers and sue, sue the institution about what happened to them. And, and I got a fucking computer, laptop, you know, I'm, I'm at, you don't get taught. I didn't know how to send an email. I didn't even know how to use an ATM. So I had to learn all this shit when I got out and I was all just trial and error trying to surround myself with people and I had all this work coming at me. I was processing 50 survivors a week at one stage. And um, and I got out and my, my objective to get out of prison was I'm going to work seven days a week, 12 hours a day for two years. That was just to keep myself fully busy, fully focused and out of trouble and I'd done it consummately. I would have been working 16 hours a day. I was just that so focused on building this organization I was uh, and I did not today you know we're massive we employ 22 people we've got 19,000 clients we're with 42 different law firms nationally someone said to me months ago they said Russell you're a healer and I went what the fuck and you know that's a real hippie terminology isn't it and she goes because I don't know any anyone that's been involved in healing more people than you have fuck man I took my breath away like to yeah how many banks Allegedly, the twelve. Do? Allegedly, about thirty-five. But when did you get convicted for twelve? And how long you done in prison? Twenty-three. Twenty-three years. Twenty-three and two years. Boys, so I have done twenty-five all up. Done twenty-five all up. You know. See, but, after all the abuse and that, and then you were going to the prisons in your twenties. Were you still scared that it would have carried on from when you were like thirteen, sixteen? Because nah, I was a different beast by then. I just really see one of the uh, one of the look. Reactive behaviours for an abuse is often violence, and I just become another fucking level of violent. You know, and reactive behaviours for abuse can be, you know, obviously drug addiction. But I had both. I had the violence, like if you fuck with me, I'll kill you. I'll just stab you. You know, I, I really got to that stage. Like, and I'll be honest with you, in the mainstream prisons, none of that was happening. None of that sexual abuse stuff was happening. It was happening in where they fucking got those fucking degenerates, where they housed them, they, where kids should have never been housed. They knew. It, it, it's like putting a lamb in a lion's cage. You know what's going to happen, right? It's gonna, they're going to fucking eat. It's no different than putting a 15-year-old amongst a bunch of pedophiles, a 16-year-old amongst a bunch of pedophiles. The pedophiles are going to eat the kid. They're going to fucking destroy it. What year was this? 1984. It's, but it's, it's sad to think all those years... The 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, through the prison system, the amount of shit that goes on. Okay. Now I think it's more spoke spoke about and it's more... Listen, any and I always get shit for this, but any man who works with kids, you've got to question them. Any football coach, anybody who works with young kids, any scout, because the majority of abuse comes from mm. men. And it, there, there is good people yeah. out there who genuinely want to help kids yeah, and support them. And I get that, but you've still got to question because my kids don't have sleepovers. Yeah. And it's not because of the parents, it's maybe because of the uncle comes mm. in or the friend or the next door yeah, neighbor. Yeah. I don't fucking trust them. Yeah. I don't know them. If you, I know you, yeah. I would still wouldn't let them stay because yeah. I don't know what goes on up here. You can only yeah. know some done through the vision and what you've learned from them. But <clears throat> I think everybody should go through some sort of polygraph test who works with kids. Mm. And people say they can be tricked, they can be this, but I would rather have somebody maybe lose a job than potentially losing a kid to child abuse. Mm. Like uh, that's so much destruction. Like I look at I look at I look at them jails. Like a lot of my work is from prisons. A lot of a lot of my clients have been in prison and they like I have some of the most violent people in Australia contact me and go, hey mate, you know, I and, and the way that's real, like it's funny how they say, they say, mate, just want to tell you, you know, I was got as well. And you go, you're what? And I'll say, yeah, no, I was got to as well. And you're the first person. I've been the first person a lot of these people have ever told. And that's an honor and a privilege. Like, it's like I feel very privileged that people see me in that light, feel safe to be vulnerable enough to tell me that. Because, you know, the, that's what I've learned. The growth in my, my real strength in my life come from that moment I learned how to be vulnerable. Like man, I I can do fucking pretty thing, good things in gyms and everything, or like training or whatever, or whatever. But my real strength came from the moment I went fuck. I, I sat on that bed, I looked at that pad, I seen this fucking thing about a thing, and that was that moment of vulnerability, that moment of really authentic, authentic vulnerability, the growth from that 
20 minutes what I wrote for, the growth that I've got out of that in my life today, just like, you know, men, men in particular, like we talk about domestic violence and stuff like that. You know what I mean? Where does it come from? You know what I mean? It comes from fucking trauma. It comes from trauma. We can, we can, we, as men can fix so many problems by becoming vulnerable. I think it's, but what what's in it? What's in vulnerability? You got to trust someone, right? You got to trust them, and and you you're worried about someone taking the piss out of you for being vulnerable. Hug them if they take the piss out of you for being vulnerable. You hug them. They're seeing you in your strongest moment, and they can't they can't fucking identify that as strong being real strength. Fucking hug them, hug them, and say feel sorry for them people. You know, what, just, yeah. What was it like speaking about the abuse for the first time? Horrible, horrible, but. I speak about it, but it, it got easier. It got, it got easier. And the more I talk about it, now it doesn't bother me one bit. It's just... Your you know, story. Yeah, it's my story. It's what it is. I made peace with it. You know what I mean? Fucking, I didn't I didn't ask for it. You know, it wasn't my fault. You know, all that, all of them silly things that I questioned myself over that sexuality shit, all that stuff, you know. I talk about, I talk about, you know, there's a few things. A greatest, a perpetrator's greatest weapons are victim silence and shame. That's their greatest weapon. If they live in full of fucking shame and all that sort of stuff, they're, they're happy. They know they're sweet. But I talk about this thing that I carried. That carry, I carried a backpack of you know, bricks, and every brick had a label on it. Embarrassment, shame, guilt, and all that sort of stuff. When I started telling my story, I was pulling them bricks out and pepper, pelting them at the perpetrator's head and saying, yeah, you fucking have that. This belongs to you. And I say that to anyone that's ever went through it. Mate, it's you know, it'll be the best thing you'll ever do. It takes, man, step forward. Step forward and do it, you know what I mean? And best thing I've ever done. But I talk to men, in, you know, in particular, you know, because if men can't be vulnerable, they'd be violent. A lot of cases, you know. That's what uh, I, I really believe that. If you if you don't feel safe enough to be vulnerable, you, there's a fair chance you're going to be violent. It's, it's, it's an energy. It's going to come out some way. See, the woman who said she believed you is it, was that the first time you'd felt that you could trust someone because it's the first time someone says that they believed everything that went on because you try to speak about it and everybody it was the first time anyone ever said they believed me mm -hmm. and I, I got a, I've got this mate of mine who's one of the richest men in Australia and, and he said it the other day like a few months ago no, well, yeah, whatever it was uh, he said in the gym he goes that's, that's all you need today mate it's just someone to believe in you and I said that's all I needed yeah. and a lot of people a lot of kids from their troubled homes all they need is someone to believe and someone to sit down and go, mate, like Oprah Winfrey and Dr. Bruce Perry wrote a book and it said, you know, what happened to you? And that's the question they ask. What happened to you? Let's talk about what happened to you. That, let's, let's not talk about what you're doing, but let's talk about what happened to you that created what you're doing. And that's where the answer lays. That's where the, that's where the solution lays. Let's work on that. Let's work, let's work what we can do to help you here. You know, what is the solutions for you, you know what I mean? Because you, you, you're feeling all this shit. That, you're most, that kid's mostly feeling a lot of shit that don't belong to them. When you can break it down and explain, oh, hey, man, that's not yours. Where were you at your lowest? I think, I think when I got pinched for that bank robbery, when I, when I, was, I was going back to jail, I was going to jail to knock myself, and I, I mean, I don't like sound like a fucking idiot, but this is when the universe just intervened and said, mate, I've got bigger plans for you. You know, so you were going to kill, kill yourself? Oh, percent. I was going, I had the coax, you know, I, was, I, was, I had it all planned, you know. I was going to knock myself with um, the coaxial cable for the TV. I knew how to do it. I'd, mate, I'd seen heaps of people knock themselves in jail. I've, I've seen plenty of murders, but I've seen, I've seen, you know, part of my job as one of the cleaners was cleaning up a cell after someone had killed himself, you know. Didn't mind it because you've got a free radio, you've got their shoes and shit. Like, God, no, it was fucking cold as it seemed, but... You ended up with all the good stuff, you know. I know that fucking people like it, but that's true. That's that's just that cold world of jail. Like I can remember blokes going, "I'm going to knock myself," and old mate would say, "Oh mate, them fucking shoes were right here. You're going to leave me them, you know?" I'm like, "Fucking what?" That's just that cold, harsh environment. That's what those people go. Fuck. So see, after that, when you when you spoke to this woman, what year was this? When she said she believed you? Oh man, I, I, I was. It, it took a long time for me to really absorb that. But there was a something telling me that fucking she was all right. You know what I mean? She was, this one was all right. I'd that, seen, and this was in prison. Yeah. I was, I was how on, long did you have left? Still, oh, maybe three years. 
I was only kicking off. I, I, I was about a year and or four year bottom, about a year and four year bottom, and it's like, uh, but it was just I don't know. I, I was, it was cathartic. It was soothing to hear someone, even if they didn't fucking mean it. Well, even if they didn't mean it, just the fact that they acknowledged it, they look. But she said a few things that made sense. She goes, Russell, your name's been dropped. Your people have fucking mentioned you, and they mentioned she mentioned the perpetrators' names. And I went, they're still alive. Yeah, I, one of them was at that stage. And, see all the changes you've went through now, trying to heal and do the right thing and help others. See if you ever seen those people who abused you as a kid. What do you think you would do? Oh man, that's a that's a good question. It's a good question. Yeah, I'd it's, I'd be hard not to fucking just fucking jump all over their head. But but what at what cost for me? Because mate, the way the law's fucking the way the law is these days, I'd get more for that than he would have ever got for abusing me. You know. So and my life today, I don't gamble with it. What I've got today, my peace of mind, and that's that's a that's a really good question that because it's it's vexed for me. Part of me want to kill him, and part of me would say I value the life I have today. Yeah, it's a tough one, and I yeah. always speak about him. But Jeff Thompson you should get Jeff on your podcast. He was he's one of the, the toughest men on the planet. He's like an eighth dan, ninth dan. Yeah. He was abused by his instructor as a kid, and um, he calls it the parasite that grew inside him. It just get bigger and bigger. Yeah, right. Yeah, and rage. He, he became like a nightclub bouncer, just beating people up, nearly killed someone. Yeah, and always visualized about killing this man, <clears throat> and it. Bear in mind, through the years, I became like an eighth dan. He wrote all these books, and um, he seen his abuse on a cafe, and he froze. Bear in mind, this man's a killer. Yeah, froze. Guy had his power. He went and approached the man, came face to face with the man, and by that, that when the man broke down, he approached him, but he done it with so calm, calm, collective, and from that day on, he took his power back because he didn't have that strength because I had some sort of internal fucking power and um, I approached him and the man broke down this and that and he just walked away and just he felt as if that was the first time the parasite died because then he realised it's not got the power over me anymore because he never spoke about it and then he started speaking about it like you say it becomes easier mm. because there's all that shame of was it my fault did I leave it on was I enjoying it all this bullshit that people go through and that's the hard thing about people who go through that dark stuff but when you get your power back, it's a beautiful thing because now you're healing others. Like, yeah, it's obviously. Did any of them ever get convicted? No, nothing. No, nothing. Nothing from that scoop. The boys. But here's a here's. I just what you just said there. One of my my trauma counselor one day. I go. I get on the phone and she goes. Today we. She goes. I got a plan. I was like, oh, that? She. We're, we're going to kill our fucking pedophile. I said what? And she goes. We're going to kill a pedophile. She goes. Is there anywhere where's one in the jail? I said yeah. I reckon I could. She goes. Could you get to him? I said, oh, I'd have a fucking, I'd, I'd jump a few fences, but I reckon a few screws would be chasing me. And I said, but, so we, she, we started doing stats on it. Jump in the fence, you get in there. She goes, you stab him. How many is in the wing? I said, they're all dogs in that wing. They're all putrids. And I said, how many would tell on you? I said, oh, 61, 60, the whole, the whole fucking, they'll, they'll tell on me. And she goes, would you be able to get really close? I said, you'd need a bit of time to chop them up and fucking flush them down the toilet. And she goes, and then I broke down, I was 120% chance I was going to get pinched for it, right? And she goes, so, and then what's the consequences? Mandatory 20 years jail, right? Because that's what it is in Queensland, mandatory 20 years jail. And she, and this, we started, and because it, it comes back to resentments, right? And she goes, so who is affected the most? So oh. she goes, well, obviously you are, you're affected the most, but then your children and your family and everything like that. And then, and she goes, is it worth it? I said, no. She said, let go of your resentments. And she goes, they're fucking worthless. You know, them resentments that you carry towards this are fucking worthless. They don't serve you nothing. And it was just a really nice way. And, I, and it just made so much sense to me. Resentment will res like rust the vessel it's contained in, yeah? Re having a resentment is like having a drink and a cup of poison and hoping someone else dies from it, you know? And I, I, I know that with that. Like, I don't have resentments these days. I... I fight, I fight for survivors. Like the other day, there was a thing in a Supreme Court judge in Sydney said, 13 year old boys often bring on their own sexual abuse." That was a that was the fucking sentencing comments. A Supreme Court. That's how out of touch the judiciary is. 
worldwide, I gather, because it's just not Australia. And, you know, and I jump, man, I blow up about that shit because I'm always, I've got a big team. We've got a big team. There's a big bunch of advocates. In Australia, pedophiles can hide their wealth in their superannuation so they can't be sued. They can just fucking get everything. Sort of protected. Yeah, they, they get out. There. Why is it so bad in Australia? I had my friend work over there at Carla and she says even the but the Catholic Church is rife. Oh, and rife. people and what happens is they just they're just paying people out, so it just it doesn't go to court, is that correct? Yeah, hundred percent. It's a thing. That's what I, I work in the field of. They they do what's called a mediation because they don't want it exposed. The church fucked up really bad over there recently. They they contested in high court and they, the high court ruled against them. And the first one they they took on the high court and they had the Catholic Church and the fucking church courts hammered and paid and give some bloke a four and a half million dollar payout. You know, I got a paid out. I got paid three hundred and seventy grand. But that, you know, I'm, it's a pittance of what I've done in my life. I got three hundred and seventy grand. Being a bit, but, but I'll be honest with you, I invested a lot of that money into my own healing. I was a lot of counselling. I put myself in a couple of private rehabs, and you know, and but but I guess you know with the I think it, it did serve me well. I, I, I was dead. When I got that money, after the lawyers finished, I had 220 grand. And I was fucking, I was determined I'm not going to spend one cent of that on drugs because that's fucking pain money. You know, that money was not just, pay, that wasn't blood, sweat and tears. That was something else, you know. So I just done a lot of really proper counselling I've done. And, uh, you know, and I, I built, put the infrastructure of my business into it too. So, you know. You know, I, I I've worked hard, man. I've worked hard, and and I no one give me nothing. No one give me nothing. I I've worked hard, but you know, I live by the notion I give more than I take. You know, and I and I love that. I love having a kind heart, and a lot of my work is you know, fuck. When I, 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 but I've had to learn to put myself first too, in a lot of ways, because I was answering messenger calls at two o'clock in the morning by someone wanting to tell their story for the first time. That was draining me. And my partner at the time said, you got to fucking look after you here, you know. And I was doing, a lot of my stuff was I was doing the trauma interviews myself. So I was interviewing everyone, I was asking the questions, not too dissimilar to what we're doing now. Going through the abuse, blow by blow and asking all the questions. And I've done a thousand, I've done a thousand interviews. I've done a thousand interviews and the last one I'd done was my mate who's doing life's most probably never be released from jail. I couldn't do another one because the objective when you're doing an interview is you don't visualise it. Like it's just words, right? So we're doing this interview. Man, you're talking now and you're visualising different things that I've spoken about and I'm visualising when, when you and I talk different things. That was just words. I used to be able to do this process where I just, it was just words to me. I couldn't visualise. With his, I was seeing the whole fucking thing and it really got to me. I even put myself in a rehab for a month after it because it fucking really got to me. I said to my business partner, I can't do them no more. He goes, ah, oh, time's up. I can't do them no more. I still have a lot of people telling me this story for the first time, but I don't go into too much depth about it. Do you have a question, why me? 100%. 100%. I was a little blonde-headed, surfy-looking kid. And, um, yeah. You know what? I often think, you know, if the circumstances were different, if I grew up in a different area or something, maybe I wouldn't. But you know what? The reality is... But here's another thing. Someone asked me recently, would you change a thing? And I'm, you know what? I fucking wouldn't. Because today I've got the life. I wouldn't. The life I've got today is the happiest I've ever been in my life. I can honestly mean it. I wouldn't. I was sitting there with my girl the other day and I said, I wouldn't change a thing. I wouldn't, wouldn't fucking want to be in the Bahamas or anything like that. I want to be here right now. Because learning to be abuse survivors have this thing where we're not in the, we don't stay in the present. We're always thinking oh you know always thinking outside of ourselves always wanting to be somewhere else and what i've learned is to be here right now i'm right here right now i'm grateful i'm right here now we're one of my favorite podcasters i feel grateful and i think for me a big thing for me is gratitude gratitude is the conduit to my peace and happiness if i'm happy with what i've got right now i can see the little things i've got fucking two legs that works my eyes work i can breathe i haven't got emphysema Fuck man, I'm I'm happy, and that's my my whole life purpose these days is just so simplistic. I don't need, I don't. I've got all, I've had all, and I've got all the material stuff, nice cars and farms and shit like that. But that I've learned if I'm nothing, nothing, you know, without it, I'll be nothing with it. So you're taking heroin? Yeah. Were you injecting or smoking? Yeah, injecting it. 
and prison as well. Yeah, I got hep C from it. I used from some fucking really like I, the first yeah <laughs> the first the first needle I used it had a nail and it had a thong a piece of thong cut out as the plunger and it was like fucking man that thing was dang that 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 looked like a fucking thing you know I'd done the Hep C treatment coming out of prison I cleared all that you know I got a really I'm in good good health but um. But I seen some real sick shit in there, like blokes shooting up with blood in the syringes, and HIV was just coming around then too, you know. Ease. Yeah, I was watching a lot. Of, I'd seen three or four mates get HIV off of one bloke, and that was sad. But um, but we're all rolling the dice. We're still doing it. Didn't give a fuck. Didn't deter us. Because when life doesn't matter, life don't matter, right? Well, it doesn't, who gives a fuck about AIDS? Like, you, you know, you, the part of what you're trying to do is die anyway. You're trying to speed up the process. Why do you think you're still here? God, you know, the, now I'm not religious, not one bit, but it just had a purpose for me, you know. Had a purpose for me and I'm doing the work I'm doing now and the work I'm doing now is helping people heal. And um, I'm really passionate about this youth crime stuff. We've got a big problem. I think it's worldwide with youth crime. I'm really passionate about that. I do a lot of research. I'm trying to get involved in it. My biggest opposition for me getting involved in it is the police. They don't want me involved in it. In Australia, they don't like solutions. They don't like it because it's, it's fucking. It keeps them. It keeps the police more like. Keeps them on a job. Keeps them in a job. What do I want a solution for? They want bigger guns. They want more. Yeah, they want st- promotions and more money. Yeah. That's that. You, know. you take away your legalized drugs. Then everything falls. Well, look at Portugal. I think we talked about it before. Yeah. You know what I mean? They, they, clo- they closed the jails. Yeah. They closed jails. They changed yeah. the game. Yeah. Because they were helping prisoners. And like in the UK, I don't know what it's like in Australia, but over 80% reoffend. And the majority yeah, have recidivism. come from broken homes. And yeah, we've got an 85% recidivism rate over there. Our recidivism rate's crew, right? But then look at Norway. It's got a 12% recidivism rate. Why? Why don't? Why? 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 why, why What's looking? Norway doing different in the prison system? Treating them like humans. They're qualifying them. They're qualifying. They're giving them, giving them skills. They're giving them counselling. They're working with psychs and psych. They're psychologists and psychiatrists are working. When they're doing a breakdown, they're working out what the underlying issue is. When you work out, like here's a, an example, right? You get a car. The fucking thing breaks down. You push it in the garage. The thing's not starting. You push it in the garage. When it's in the garage, you kick the doors in, smash the windows, pour fucking sugar in the fucking tank. You pull out in 12 months' time. And then you think, why does this thing don't start? Why does it start? The fucking thing's more broken than it was when you pushed it in the fucking garage. That's the analogy of jail. We damage people in prison. We make them more traumatized. We damage them more when we put them in there. And they, they come out, they're not fucking, they're not going to start. They're not going to be productive. But when we put them in there and we fucking, you know, lift the bonnet up, fucking check the oil, put fucking new gaskets in, go through it, put new brake calibers on it, you know what I mean? Fucking give it a polish ring. That's when the fucking thing starts. It's going to take you places. It's going to be productive. It's that simple. There's no rehabilitation in prison. Fucking, I used to sit on a, they'd put me on a sewing machine sewing up body bags. And I'd say, and I'd go, and I'd put my hand up to the scrub. I'd say, I don't have a sewing problem. I don't need that. I said, am am I going to get it? A job when I get out sewing? And they said, most probably not. I said, what am I fucking doing this for? And sewing fucking police uniforms and shit like that. Like, fuck off. I refused to work in their workshops. And they'll say, I'd leave me out of this. They'd say, well, you'll be locked in your cell on that. So that'd be it. What was it like going to rehab for the first time? Challenging. I remember the first time I went to rehab, there's a guy, he was so full of knowledge, and I thought he was like a fucking guru of recovery, right? And I come out of the detox. And, he, and there was this door and there was a footpath that went around, around and he goes, you've got a choice. He goes, you're only young. He goes, you can walk through that door there. And he goes, you're going to pick up a bunch of knowledge. He said, I'm actually going to destroy your ability to use comfortably. Or he said, see that footpath? You can walk around and go out and actually use and enjoy it for a bit. You know? And he said, what do you choose to do? And, and I said, I'll walk in and get some knowledge. You know, more for learning. And I did. And um, I just learned so much, even though I never got it that time. But that seed got planted. I mean, that sad story about that guru, he died about six weeks after I was talking to him of a heroin overdose, which really shook me a lot when he died, that guy, because I thought, fuck, he had so much knowledge. He was like the fucking, he was just a guru of recovery. How can you die with that much knowledge of recovery? 
you know. But the ability, that's the thing that does kill people. When they've got all that knowledge in their head, they've got to keep having bigger shots and shots to get over it, you know. Yeah, that's the thing. You can have all the knowledge in the world, but everybody's got triggers. Yeah. But they can control how they feel and that certain emotion to then, it takes them back to that pain of the past. Yeah. Everybody, that's how it's, it fucking scares me to get back on it. I've not got another recovery in me. I'm yeah. fucked. I'm gone. There's yeah. no there's no going back because it's still painful six years later yeah never mind building a career building a legacy to then i would fucking destroy it in 24 hours oh that's a you know what it's progressive disease it's a progressive so wherever you were fucking yeah if you would have kept using for six years you pick up that's where you're back at yeah a million percent i was i was 12 years clean when i picked up 12 years clean and sober when i picked up and fucking wow i wasn't ready for that what made you pick up again after 12 years yeah drinking you know i thought I you always had. Here. I always. Ha- I always thought uh, that I'd be able to get a like and just drink here and there, have one beer and there. Like, man, I can't have one roll of fucking chocolate. I ate the whole block. <laughs> but they drink. Yeah. You know yourself as an antidepressant. Yeah. It does take the pain away for a yeah. few hours. It fucking yeah. does, and it's a beautiful feeling. If you could bottle that up and put it in a pill when it was natural, I would take yeah. it every fucking day right. because it's like you say when you took that first shot of heroin. That was your void. That was your love because yeah. it cared for you because it, it took away your pain. That sinking feeling. Oh, yeah, it was mother. It was the mother of all mothers. The mother's milk. It was It was just the warmth. Like, I never got that feeling ever again. But that was that whole thing, man. Like, that the drink, I think, the drink romanticized me. It was like, oh, I was watching a beer. Come, maybe I can have one of them. You know, I had one drink the one week and I had fucking 24 the next. Yeah. And XTC pills and everything like that. I just, I jumped back on and... um and, and and I realised the progressive nature of the fucking. I used to talk. We used to talk about that in, in A meetings about the progressive nature of the fucking the addiction. It's like you jump off, but you're not the the addiction itself is still growing. It's still fucking growing within you. It's still fucking strong. It's still there. You pick up. You'll be fucking where you were. It's like you never fucking stop. Man, that was a whirlwind. That oh, fucking some energy in that. Like. The way I used, because I used to look down at people that drinking beer at fucking six o'clock in the morning, and I was drunk. You know, I was, I was one of these guys that, pre- that only used heroin, didn't smoke pot, didn't drink, only used that. Now I want to fucking stuck needles in my eyes if it would made me feel good, because that's how fucking bent I was. But um, man, just how many times did you do? Oh, twenty. I had a dude on a plane. I was on this four-hour plane, plane ride when I escaped. I fucking I had a shot in the toilets. I sat down and there's fucking plate full of food. And I'm fucking I do. My mate's trying to wake me up. I got a fucking earful of fucking mashed pumpkin. And my mate's saying, "Look at you, you fucking idiot." And I was saying, "What's that?" He's fucking feeling this fucking mashed pumpkin. We're on like we're flight on a four hour flight from Sydney to Perth. For like fuck, yeah. I that's the way I use drugs, man. I wait. I use drugs to the end. Like I needed to. Uh, like be one of those bikes who hardly keep my eyes open, but I hardly move. You know, what I mean, that's how I use. I just where where was your mum and dad at this time? When did the, the my they... dad passed away from uh, when I was seventeen, emphysema. Did he know about anything? No, no. When when that abuse took place, I'll tell you something else. So when it was taking place, where I lived in that boy's home, we where where my house was, there's only. I, I could, it was a 10k run I, I could run that in say 50 minutes so I ran home once with the intentions of telling them what was going on and my dad was really sick he's out in the back of the lawnmower fucking pushing the fucking lawnmower around so he sit down he sat down I made the lawn for him and I was going to tell him but I thought fuck this will kill him because my dad was a big man like in his day by the time he died he was fucking 40 kilos he was a big man and he was a fighting man too you know and you know, and it would have would have killed him because that he would have wanted to do something. You know, someone doing that to his son, and I, I made a conscious decision there and then not to tell him, not to tell. Him. And I, I didn't want to tell my family. I got every intention to get there, and then it was the embarrassment kicked in. I'm like, they're going to think I'm fucking gay. You know? So you escaped. Yeah, I was you escaped from the prison. Boy, from the boys' home. Yeah, because there was no fences. There was so no. You escaped from the prison to tell your dad mm. that you were being abused, but your dad was dying, so you, you never. Yeah, I couldn't him. tell him. I, never, I just never had it in me tell him and and then and then the boys home contacted my family and said listen Russell run away if he hands himself in we're not going to charge him and my so my parents said come on mate we'll drive you back out there and drove me back out I was like fuck here we go and I just turned it on they put me in this um it was called a boob right it was like a isolation cell and it was 
about two degrees. It gets really fucking cold out there. No clothes, no blankets, fully naked. And then come in and do the sexual abuse. And that wasn't just me, a couple of other kids. And that was just, that was fucking pretty fucked up. You know, and, and adding violence and all like fucking kicking the shit out of you too while you're, you know, while they're doing their thing. They were just, I don't, I don't understand this. Like, I don't, like, what, what, if I'm going to have a fight, I like a challenge, yeah? I like to know the bloke's going to have a crack back or whatever. But there's no challenge in a fucking 40 kilo kid. And you're a man, 100 kilo plus man. There's, what's the challenge? Like, what sort of person are you? You know what I mean? You're just a fucking filthy degenerate. You know, I got accused. There was a, I was down at Junee Prison and I got accused of trying to kill a pedophile. He had his leg half cut off and he had his head caved in. And he had a toupee on. And when they found a toupee, it was on the ground covered in blood and the screws are saying, they've scalped him, the mongrels have scalped him. Anyway, I was the main suspect in that. And I couldn't believe the lapse that they went. Like 17 man coppers investigating that. And one of the things the coppers said to me, and I said, look, I, I, I know nothing about this. I know nothing about it. I knew nothing about it. But I said, but this bloke's a pedophile, right? Do you have 17 coppers investigating what he did? They went, no. Nah. Oh, mate, you're all the same. I said, what, what did you just say? He said, yeah, you rob banks, you do, mate. He said, you're all the same. You're all tarred with the same brush of criminals. And I went, fuck it. So you'd rather someone fucking, you think it's just as bad robbing a bank as someone touching your kid? I said, you haven't got value on your kids. And he goes, ah, oh, mate, he's all full of excuses. And I went, I told one of the screws, one of the prison officers who's like high up in management, he went and grabbed the cover. He said, mate, don't go talk like that. You'll cause a riot in this fucking jail. He said, you can't have that. The fucking whole jails want to kill you. But anybody who agrees with that is a pedophile themselves, think, as I know. Yeah, anybody, yeah. Where, I would rather sit at a dinner table with a fucking bank robber or a drug lord than a oh. fucking nonce. You wouldn't oh, want to even sit with them. I'm a father, so I'd do everything to protect my kids. And anybody to think that kind of shows you their colours and who they are within. It doesn't mm. make sense. It doesn't. You know, in Australia, we've got this task force, it's called Raptor, and they investigate bikies. Hundred, no, 140 of them. 140 of these coppers in his bikey task force. And they've got another one called Argos that investigates Shulmice. That's 12. So the government tell us over there the bikies pose a bigger threat than the pedophiles do. It's fucking crazy. Well, I, well, like, I'm not particular fans of bikies, but I'd rather have one of them living next to me than a fucking pedophile. It's yeah, crazy. Well, too long. But they say one in every 30 has got pedophile tendencies. Yeah. So it's one in every street. Yeah, hundred percent. And you know, it's funny because I've been I've been going out to to country towns, um, just doing doing talks and stuff like that. And and I and I see I I I see some dodgy looking cunts getting out there. Like and, I, and you see them near parks and stuff like that. You know what I mean? And what do you do? Like you go and smash their face in. You know what I mean? Or you go and check their phone or whatever. You know what I mean? You you can't do it. The the laws are so. They're so fucking protected. You can't go up to one of them and say, hey, mate, what are you taking photos of that kid? They ring the coppers and you're fucking getting fucking pinched for harassing him. You say, mate, I was just seeing you taking photos of that kid in that car in that school. And what the, or, or, or the playground or something. What are you doing? Like, I've seen it. I've seen it in my own eyes where there's been someone hanging around the park like, and, and the parents have pulled in and said, mate, stop taking photos of our kids. And they go, I can, I can do what I want. They're so well protected. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. See, so becoming a father yourself, did you? Were you worried for your kids? Hundred percent. And how were you feeling? Because it's not that you would have, but one in three become abusers themselves. With the stats, were you ever concerned that you could have? Can I tell you something now? In Australia, I got told by a psychologist once: seventy-five percent of child molesters were molested themselves. Right? All right. I got nineteen thousand clients, nineteen thousand survivor clients. Not one of them is a child molester. That dispels that. That's bullshit. So what? Who gives that start then? The psycho, the psycho, uh, fucking whatever it is, psychologist association or something like that. I said that's bullshit. And they go, oh, and I said no, it's bullshit. And I said come and grab my. They don't want my data because my data will my data will dispel a lot of their facts about pedophile. But that's a hundred percent fact. But. With my own kids, you know what I mean, man. I, I I'll tell you, I'll tell you something that did happen. So, I'm in jail, and um, I get a phone call. I get this woman messages me and says, "Russell, can you call me?" So I I, I don't call many people. I only, I, the only person I used to call from prison was my mum, and I rang her and she said, "Listen, uh, this woman says your yeah, your son's stepfather's punched him up, 
and she goes, we tried to report it to the police and the police waved him away because of could because of you. I said, What do you mean? Because of me? and they said, Yeah, you know, because they reckon the kid's trying to be like you when he's trying to play up and that sort of stuff. So I rang one of my I get my mate's number on who I and I said, mate, can you go and have a chat to him? And I said, Go and have a chat to this bloke and they're telling me that put his hand. Oh, that was another big pivotal part of my I put my kids in that position. I felt like a fucking right cunt, mate. I fucking went for him. I felt so fucking bad that I wasn't there to protect my kid because I would have ate that bloke. I would have fucking, I've given that bloke so many opportunities to fucking stand up. He's just a fucking coward. Always got something to say, but just a weak dog. Anyway, but we'll ring the police straight away. You know what I mean? You'll do this sort of shit and ring the police. He's got mates that are coppers and stuff like that. So um, that was, you know, that was a big part of that. And when I when I got out of jail, I said to my, my, my young bloke, I'll never do that again. I'll never, he goes, and kids are pretty forgiving, you know. They're just happy to have their, their dad. My 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 old son lives with me now. He's got it pretty fucking good too. I might tell you, but um, my brother's son. He's. I, I got to get a DNA test on him because he's too responsible to be mine. <laughs> <laughs> he's fucking too responsible. You know, he's got his own um, earth moving business. He's got excavators and stuff like that. He'll buy his first home at twenty five. That kid, he's really really responsible. Spin image of me, you know. See all the shit that you went through, the trauma that you've been through. See when you start making changes, I always speak about this, but when you start making changes, your own conscience, mm. everything you suppress comes to the yeah. fucking forefront. See obviously all the trauma that you came through, but then when you all the banks that you've robbed yeah. and all the trauma that you caused, does yeah. that play a massive effect in your mindset? But see, I I I didn't understand what trauma was. I used to think you sort of used to think about bank tellers. They get a compo payout and fucking because I remember I had a family relative. She used to say, mate, we want the bank to get robbed because if there's any money left over, we put it down our undies and we get to keep it. And it's a fringe benefit of banking. I used to think, fuck, that'd be, I'm doing them. If I honestly believe that I was doing them a favour. Justifying it. Yeah. And I just said, but I'll tell you a funny thing, right? So I get people hit me up on social media all the time. There's a, a, a fucking, there's people in here that want to be apologised. They want you to apologise things to them that, that you haven't even done to them. And they go, Mate, I was in a fucking bank when you robbed it. Are you going to apologise? I said, no, because you weren't. You're a liar. You're right. But this one bloke contacted me, and he was, and he showed me his ID. And he's, um, he's a, he, and he said, I, I, and, he, and he, I said, well, where do we go from here? I said, you know, that's because, look, remorse ain't saying sorry. Remorse is an action. I could say to you, I'm sorry all fucking day long, but sorry is a word. Remorse is an action. Remorse is not doing it again. Remorse is making yourself better that you don't affect people like that. And, you know, I don't say sorry no more to no one. Because I don't have to. I've done 23 years. But I'm remorseful. I don't do that shit no more. So I don't. my, my behaviour these days don't affect them people. And in actual fact, you know, I think my behaviour today benefits the community or what I do. So, you know. But this guy, this guy is pretty cool. He's fucking really cool. He goes, oh, I love what you do. He goes, he goes, he goes I'm not ringing you asking for an apology he goes but i want you to know what it did to me she goes, and this bank i robbed in particular i went in with high vis vests you know the vis vest and, and just he goes every time i see one of them on the street he sends shutters down he goes and, and he, 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 recit, he recited the 14th of january 2014 was the best day of my life and i said well, what is that and he goes that was the day you got arrested in queensland and i went yeah sweet and um and i just yeah it was just interesting to realise the effects of my behaviour, like, it didn't make me feel any good. Like, I went, fuck, you know, but to absorb it and go, there's a reason why never to do that shit again, because that's what you do to people. And to own it, like, you know, owning my own shit's been massive, not being a, not pointing fingers. That's where growth comes from. And just going, you know what, I fucked up, I own it. I'm not doing that shit again. These are the plans I'm making sure that, these are the plans I'm doing to make sure I don't do it again. You know, I'm doing the trauma counts. I'm doing everything. I'm not picking up drugs. I'm not. There's a thing called uh, pig problematic system gratification. They're fucking, you know, I think we've all got them. You know, we just do things without constant. I, I see a crim walking down the street these days across the road because I don't want to hear it. I don't want to, like, I've, I don't want to know about criminal behavior. I'm not interested in any one bit. I've had things put to me that have come off and I'll fucking kick myself. But I haven't got that jail in me no more. You know what I mean? I haven't got it in me and I haven't got... I just don't want my behaviour to affect other people. Like today, I like my behaviour, my actions to affect people in a good way. 
where it was healing or do a lot of work with families of kids that are drug addicted and that sort of stuff, you know, or just sending people messages, kids messages or, or whatever, you know, I've got pretty big following over there and and I can have a real big social impact. I can have a big social impact in a positive way. I'm a community man, you know what I mean? I never thought I would be. I just thought people like, I would blow our sucker. I like, I, 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 You've become one, bro. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'd, become, <laughs> I'd become the person I despise. The world needs balance. Yeah. You know what I mean? When you're in that life of crime or the dark side, everybody's a fucking grass or a snitch or a hundred percent not at your level. It's narcissistic the, too. Yeah. That's it's, the bit. It's the ones, that's what thinking. The working class man, we talk about the Bronx tale. Uh, working as the hero. Uh, yeah. What's the, what's the most you, you stole out of a bank? Well, 110,000, which is equivalent to about six or seven hundred now in 1990 the national oh, commonwealth bank at lane cove is another affluent area because all my banks i robbed were i was I, I justified myself i was like a robin hood yeah i was stealing from the wealthy to give for them with the old kamikaze jobs just rocking in like back then see they never had they never had uh a glass or tellers or anything or shutters or anything like that i was just open you just go straight over get to them and you always stayed like in a bank got drawers where the cash is and then you've got cupboards where the real big notes are and that's where you always went or get the safe they were fun man I, people say have you done parachute and i say have you robbed the bank mm-hmm. i was thinking i've done both it was a thrill and you know and and you know you leave the trauma out of it and they'll fucking know there should have been an olympic sport if you know what i mean you're the back old metal bro what was the feeling knowing that you're going to rob a bank Man, I was pumped. It was like, because I've racked in the banks with blokes that have hesitated and I've had to drag them in. It was like, it's, some are built for it and some are not. Like, I, one bloke, he went to run away. I said, what the fuck? I just grabbed him by the shirt and just fucking dragged him in with me because he had the gun and I was going over the counter. And I said, I was not going in there without someone with a gun. You know, and dragged him in and then he realised what he had to do. But some people, it's, no, you just don't hesitate, you know, and this is... That's an analogy of life. You fucking hesitate, you know, and like things can go fucking wrong. You know what I mean? But it's mad, Dad, that people are built for certain things. Like, I haven't, I've interviewed so many different people, but even then, you probably get a stone cold killer who wouldn't rob a bank because they'd be too scared, but yet they would put a bullet in your fucking head. Yeah. yeah what do you think that is? We humans that are kind yeah, of wired up different. That's, I think I'd rob the bank a thousand times before I actually rob one. I think I've been there a thousand times because I'd pictured it in my head enough times to know what I was going to do. Like when you're talking, like I'm, 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 I don't know, I don't know if I'm different than anyone else. But when when you're talking, like if I'm talking to a bloke, how to rob a bank, I'm visualising myself doing. It. So I've been there a hundred times or whatever. Do you think yeah. you manifested that? Yeah, hundred percent, I did. I believe in manifestation. Man. Like I sat back down in my prison cell and manifested the life I've got today, and I've got it, and I reckon a bit more. You know, I'm being really, and I remember talking to blokes about what I was going to do from jail. I go, shit, talker, shit, talker. Then blokes ring me now from prison. They go, you fucking did it. You fucking did what you said you were going to do. See the do- I watched a documentary on you last week. Strange was story. F- yeah. Thirty-two minutes. It was an old one. Yeah, you seemed dying, grey, and yeah. fucking. Yeah. You were talking to the what was his name? Switzer. What was his David name? Swartz. Swartz. Yeah. I'm just kidding. And uh, you were just angry. You fucking liar. You were calling him, and you just hate me. You don't say anything positive. Yeah. But you can see that side of you. Yeah. You had that. You were lost soul. Oh, 100 percent. And why know, did they record that? That was part of a documentary called. Uh, hope in hell about Long Bay Prison. There's a yeah, and I just happened to have movie star looks when I was a kid. <laughs> I don't know, but anyway, I was described. It was funny because I copped heaps of grief, and it said um, there was a thing in uh, Who magazine about me. They said, and there was about a, the girl from the bank. She got pinched with us, and they said uh, Russell Mance so was a, a breaking in imagine who was graduated to armed robbery who had soap style looks and I used to cop fucking like I looked like Jason Donovan when I was a kid <laughs> and then I used to cop heaps in jail but you know it's you know and people talk about jail someone said that, like I seen a comment the other day I was, I was on a live and someone was talking about was jail fun jail was fucking fun at times we entertained ourselves like man I fucking I was I become a barber, you know, and I get these white collared blokes that have got big trolls come up and I cut their hair and I leave them with a bald head and a rat's tail and shit like that. Like, that shit's funny. Or there was a bloke I hated, he was um, pinched on killing his wife and I just fucking don't like them people. And I used to get in where the washing was and I'd get there 
and rub his jocks down with chili, like really hot, really hot chili, and just fucking watch him in fucking pain. Like, there's heaps of things, man. Just, well, everyone's always up to no good. There's always an entertainer in there, someone, you know. And then, you know, and then jail's a really fucking sad place. It's your kid's birthday or your kid's got the flu or sick or something like that. And, you, and, they, and, and they're saying, Dad, I just want you to come home. And you've got years to go. You know, there's that, there's that, you know. It's a lonely old place, you know. Today, fuck. It's funny, you know, James. It's, sometimes today I've lived that much life. I've been out, like, I, only, I was talking to Connor Bennett, the thing he goes, and we're talking about it yesterday about. And he said, I just, he said, how long have you been out for? And I said, seven years. Only, only seven years. Like, this is the longest I've ever been out. Only seven years? Fucking feels like a lifetime for me. I fucking only, like, fuck, I've done so much. I've been to the UK a couple of times. I've done so much. Like, I've created so many good memories since then. The bad ones are becoming a distant memory, you know? And that's what life is about, right? It's, well, it's a photo album of memories, you know? That's all it is, is creating memories and trying to enjoy the memories as you can though no, listen it's like anything in life is good and bad there's fucking horrible shit and there's also beautiful shit so it's, much but so it's much. just about trying to create as much as you can because it's a very fast lived life oh it is it's, I um, turned 56 on Saturday yeah this Saturday I turned 56 and it's like I can remember my dad dying at 60 I, was thinking, I used to think he was old at 60 and it, it does happen quick what's it like when you started making all the changes what was the moment for you you thought okay this is a path that i want to stay in being clean being sober not robbing banks trying to help others but when was the moment you realized you had something more than mm. just being a fucking down and out bank robber heroin addict there's been a few points been a few but i can remember once i was helping this bloke and he was part of this pharmaceutical trials i was doing pharmaceutical trials on kids in, in boys' homes, they were testing fucking pharmaceutical drugs and they'll fucking the kids up, they'll turn them into zombies. And so we had a class action against a pharmaceutical, some pharmaceutical company. And anyway, and he sent me this text and he talked about heroes. He goes, You know, everyone, every, every man needs a hero. And he goes, oh, I've found mine in you. That was this really beautiful fucking text. You know, and he died two weeks later. There's complications from that same medication that they, they were trialing on him. And I just realized that impact that I can have on people in a positive light. I'm a, I'm a guy, man. I've got an ego like anyone else. And I, it feels good. But the feel goods I chase these days are being a part of people's healing and watching, watching like through social media, you get the opportunity. Like I can see a client. I say, this bloke's my client. And you can watch the transition from him coming out of jail to getting a little car working as a fucking lollipop fucking guy and meeting a girl and having their first child and I'm, I'm getting to that stage where i'm seeing this being a part of a, a nice fucking story you know mm. i mean i love being part of the nice stories because i've been in parts of some fucking horror stories too you know what i mean so just being part of people's journeys in a positive light it's so good you know and um and i'd like to think i'm going to play a big part in the, this youth crime stuff that we've got in australia i've got a lot to give lived experience so what is all the positive stuff you're doing now? Oh, well, obviously, the podcast, I do I do a lot of... But is your podcast plug out with other people The podcast is called, the, no and behold, the Stick Up Podcast. And I don't say it as in Stick Up Armed Robberies, it's Stick Up For Yourself. And that's what, you know, a good man once said, it's, it's not the Stick Up as in Bank Robberies, it's Stick Up For Yourself. And um, I do a lot of youth counselling, I do a lot of one-on-one -on -one stuff with people, and in particular families of, you know, kids that are getting into trouble. I'm starting to go, my PR people are getting me doing some a lot of talking in, in regional country towns. Um, yeah, got a fucking hot girl who's so fucking talented, it's fucking sickening. Um, I'm actually, I'm actually getting married soon. Congratulations. Yeah, I'm actually getting married. So, oh, man, that does come. This is this fucking universe shit again, like just putting someone in, like just going, fuck, you know. Someone who's like, I broke up with a barrister because we just, she's ask questions for a living i'm a criminal i don't answer them and that was that contrast she wants to ask questions i don't want to answer them and that's just in me i don't it's funny i can do a podcast like this but this ain't like a cross-examination it's like when someone starts going at 441 you fucking were detected at fucking rah 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 like <laughs> fuck, leave me alone but but yeah and it's funny like this girl in particular she's so talented she's a boxer she's a rapper she's in a little bit of trouble but i can help her um comes from a knockabout family gorgeous 
smart, funny, self-deprecating. To be around me, people got to be able to take the piss out of themselves because I yeah. fucking hate it. I hate it when it's too serious. It's not fun, eh? No, yeah, fuck that. I like people who can take the piss out of themselves and not take them so serious. But when the time comes, take yourself serious and fucking get the job done, you know. I work hard. I lose myself in my work. I work big hours. I, I'm often at work at 11 o'clock at night whether it's answering messages on social media, like anyone that sends me messages on social media, answer them all. It'd be a bit hard for you, man. You've got fucking 400,000 there. But that, and, and I've got a PA, and she's, it's funny, you know, these old women say, oh, I'd like to get naughty with you, and fucking run. She goes, oh, well, it's Russell. It's Russ, Beth, Russell's PA. I'll pass that message on to them. And it's like, fine, they go all embarrassed. But love and life, you know, doing a bit of traveling now. I've got the bug. I remember here in, in Scotland. It's the first time I've ever been here. But, you know, doing a bit of traveling, just loving life. Amazing. That's loving. Yeah. That's fucking loving. I was saying, you were in Dubai the other day, yeah. last week, you know. Just, we had caused it, and then we're in America this week, and yeah. it's just raising a bar and enjoying the moments. We can crave something. It's hard to explain, but life is for living, man, and it's meeting yeah, new yeah. people, because we're going to be on our deathbed sometime, and we're going to look back and go, did I really fucking fulfill my potential? Yeah. I could have done more, and I don't want to be sitting thinking, I should have done more. So yeah, it's full steam ahead. But again, it's trying to juggle family life, and I love my dogs. And I just how good are dogs? How good? Yeah, how good dogs are dogs? Are the best. They just love you unconditionally. I don't give a fuck if your feet stink. Yeah, you know, fucking. They're just. I got. I got an American bully. She just loves me. She just loves. And that's. I think you know, a lot of people who whether it's went through trauma or had something missing in their life. That's what that dog attraction's all about. It's like you, know, you just fucking come in. You want nothing from me. You don't want a Louis Vuitton handbag. You just fucking, you just want my time. You want a fucking pat on the head. You want to be around me. You don't want me to be any girls but me. Mm. That's, that's that's life, isn't it? That's all men, boy. Men are simple. Remember, oh, are. men love dogs more than anything. Yeah. And all that, like you say, dogs don't speak back. They don't yeah. ask for much. They don't fucking ask questions. We're simple. The fucking people could just be like dogs. I give my, I'd give my dog the world. There's yeah. no judgment with dogs. That's yeah. a big thing, huh? They don't judge us. Like, yeah. They don't give a fuck who... They don't give a fuck if you've got a fucking Rolex on. Like, they mean, yeah. That shit means nothing. Yeah. yeah. I was watching... There's there's a... One on, have you ever seen a guy? He's got a dog called Church. He's an American bully. And mm -hmm. this bloke. And he's in recovery. And he's about nine years clean. And, and the dog played a big part. And I love that. Yeah. I, I, I tune in for Church's little adventures every all the time. The, the, they play a massive part in my life, man. I've just fucking grew up with them. I love them. I've seen it in jail. They used to like they used to bring dogs in from the the pounds, and they'd get that crims to fucking how, like look after them and everything. And, and the the amount of love that that dog would get, they had forty blokes in a unit. And man, I'd be blokes would be fighting over to pat that dog, and that dog was just fucking love. But that dog had love for the whole forty of them. See, for anybody watching that's maybe been in a life of darkness, the stuff that you've been through as a kid, what advice would you have for them? Man, just put your hand up, get vulnerable. Get vulnerable, man. The power and strength in vulnerability. When you, when when you become comfortable in telling your story and you talk about, you know, what has happened to you and where, where did, how you got there and everything like that, you know, and find that one person that you can share that stuff with and let the healing begin. You know, it's the best investment I've ever made in my life. What's the biggest life lesson that you've learned so far in your fifty-six years on this planet? Um. Fucking mate, own own your shit. Own your shit and grow. Like fuck, you know what I mean? And own your shit and think about what concert like, you know, just own it and, and think about the impact you you can have on other people. I choose to have the fucking positive impact on people. You know. How's um where do you go forward for the future, brother? Train my ass off. I'm doing, mate, I was, I was going to come over and challenge you to Australia versus fucking Scotland cold bar, uh, cold water. Let's punch, do it, bro. But fucking, mate. <laughs> <laughs> now you know how cool oh, that is here, oh, bro. fuck, mate. <laughs> what you do now, I just go, what the... <laughs> like, in Australia, there's a place called Goulburn. It's like the coldest place on earth. And I used to... But I jumped off here, I was saying the baths, and I said, fuck, this is another fucking yeah. cold this. I said, fuck that. Because I was going to come here because I'm known for wearing short shorts, right? I'm fucking no way. And not just yet. It's a different ball game. Here. It is. I fucking. But I'd yeah, love minus it. one, minus two. But it's a different feeling but, because people 
I see people going to the sea in Dubai or mm. eat, and I think and they're doing I say I ain't fucking cold water that's a jacuzzi yeah. this is the stuff here where you fucking jump in you don't see your dick for three days <laughs> <laughs> that's the stuff you want yeah. <laughs> fucking that's the fucking I'll come back I'll, I'll come and live here for six months before I jump in one of your locks I think <laughs> come but it's uh, it's a natural feeling for me it's trying to promote everything natural the only yeah. thing I struggle which I always speak about is eating I just love food it's my little comfort yeah the, conversations are very intense yeah. so you go and kind of eat the emotion yeah. because you've got to kind of absorb everything yeah. that's going on and it makes you question the world yeah. because a lot of people live in their own little bubble they don't yeah. know what the fuck's going on do you know what I mean I have to um, s- sit with the story sometimes and go man it's, it's fucking sad what people have to go through and you'd have to absorb a lot like yeah. you, you, you you've, 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 mate, you've interviewed some fucking heavy duty stuff like traffic people that have been trafficked man that's yeah. heavy that's heavy I've got one. In, I've got one tomorrow, on Sunday. Well, I think you might have interviewed it, the Ukrainian girl who was trafficked. Oh, she's amazing. Yeah, Loretta. Yeah, Loretta. Yeah. yeah. Are you going to interview her? Yeah, I'm interviewing. Yeah, her she's on amazing. Sunday. She's yeah. fucking amazing. Love her to bits, man. Mm. Just again, it's, it's a similar story to yourself, no? Mm. You went through the darkness, man. Yeah. You went through the fucking pain, the misery, and people think everybody's got different levels of trauma and PTSD is a real thing. There's different mm. levels to it. Somebody can get fucking fall down a set of stairs and be PTSD yeah. somebody could get fucking sexually abused or human trafficked mm. everybody's got different levels and it's how people handle those levels mm. and what you just st- sit there and fester on it and live on the past it must be hard I've never been through that level of abuse that you went through but how do you then overcome it and not let it go back to the past is it just creating positive memories for the future mm. but it levels it out awareness. and it's awareness of everything you know? Is that- I'm here right now like, I'm here right now. I'm not in the past. I'm here right now. That's the whole thing. I'm not avoiding the past. I've made peace with the past. But the most important thing right now is awareness in my surroundings. Like, my mate who's a businessman, he goes, I've never seen someone walk in a room that's... Because he said to me, tell me what's going on behind it. I could tell him. You know what I mean? He said, your awareness is like that. But being aware, and I, I'm... And, and fuck, I swear to people, man, I'll show you something. Get up in the morning. This is my routine. I get up and write five things I'm grateful for. I write 30. Two minute cold shower, whether it's fucking snowing, whatever. Two minute cold shower, shower every day. Sometimes them showers are harder than the baths. Showers are hard on the sea because it's little sprinkles. Yeah. So it's like, not fuck. if you're in the sea, you're just fucking numb. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I'm fucking pulling the breaths in. And, yeah. You know. And then for me, I go, I go down to a cafe not far from mine. It's got all the construction workers on there. I sit there and have a coffee, and I'm just so grateful that I'm on a fucking building site. You know, it gives me a dose of humility. Because my, my phone is my office. I get to go, I'm going to go and sit at fucking North Bondi at fucking 32, no shirt on, doing sit-ups on the fucking grass. I'm so grateful that I'm not in a factory, like my dreaded factory work, that I was fucking just was so scared of when I was a kid because I felt like I'm in prison. You know, the lifestyle I have today, I drive a nice Mercedes, I fucking live in a nice fucking place, but I fucking work hard. I say to people, like, I get attacked on social media and I go, oh, I work 23 fucking years, I haven't got what you've got. And I said, yeah, but you fucking don't take the opportunities, you don't take the chances I've took. You know, I said, you've actually had a thousand more opportunities come your way. I've just done something with one. You let a fucking 999 go, you know, and it's, that's what it's about. There's opportunities there for everyone in life. To do well, I've got all that material assist, but my life's not about that. I'm telling you, that's just a product of fucking hard work. Yeah. What's your biggest regret in life? What the effect that my my life, my actions had on my kids, because it affected them, especially the oldest one. He thinks he's fucking two pack. <laughs> yeah, you know, and he's a fight like he's just he went through it. He ended up doing boys hunting himself and um, kidnapped and tortured a pedophile. You know what I mean? He should have got a fucking award for it protecting his little brother but um yeah just the impact that it had on and 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 how vulnerable i made them like like you know i put him in positions where the stepfather could punch him up if i was if i was around he wouldn't have laid a hand on him because he would have ended up in the boot and the fucking gimp mask on you know and a cordless drill into his kneecap i mean all that fucking shit that's where he would have but that wouldn't have you know what i mean just how vulnerable you know and i always wanted my kids i always wanted to get my kids into boxing and in in the football and shit like that and I wasn't there for that. You know, I was when I said I was gonna have kids, I always imagined being involved in their sport and, you know, and showing them how to fight and showing them how to do that sort of stuff. And I never got a chance to do that because I was away. Some dickhead tried to say, You haven't done them out of jail, you're done. My young bloke said, Well you've done thirteen years of my life. 
and I'd done 10 years before that, you know. So, um, yeah, I was away for 13 years of his life. I went away when he was three, and I went away when the youngest one was one, and I sort of come back when he was about 14. Like, I'd sort of, I, I had my shit. I went away for 10 years, basically. And uh, I got my when I got got my shit together, you know, and, and the stepfathers go, oh, I don't believe him. He won't. And I, I love proving that rap a lot wrong. You know what I mean? Right. Do you worry that your oldest turns into be like you? Yeah, I do. I do. I worry about that a lot. And I see fucking. I see. You know, I see he's fucking. He's got no impulse control. And I see that. I see a lot of me in that kid. And I go, oh. and he's fucking so capable too. And he's so fucking capable. He will fucking. He'll go right on with it. He's fucking he's really handy and but at the moment he's got the training bug so he's at my joint so you know i'm in a position where i can get him a good job um what what we mean him challenge with he fucking loves playstation then playstations for kids are just fucking mate that cancerous he just wants to sit in the playstation all day he's going we'll go and train and i'll so uh, fuck that off and mm. fucking you know but he's, he's in the training bug at the moment. He's had his troubles. He's had his troubles, that kid. You know, he's been involved in some fucking really heavy-duty shit. Do you believe in yourself? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. I do. And, you know, me and him have had sit-downs and, and talks about, you know, I want to apologize. I said, man, I'm sorry. I fucking put you down. He said, Dad, I was always going to be like that. And he goes, man, I, I was always going to be like that. And I said, no, I don't think you were. Because I would have shown you other ways of doing things, you know what I mean? I don't think... It was, through my actions, I showed you that way of life. But if I would have been living my life different, well, I showed you another way of life. You know, I would have been just hardworking, business orientated, and everything. You would you wouldn't have seen me in that light. You wouldn't have known about that until you were old enough to understand it. I wouldn't have told you. When are you at your happiest? <sighs> when I see my girl, when I see her smile, um, and that. Oh no, no, I'll we'll say that. I'd say when I see my kids smile, when I see them doing well. But this this girl always pretty lights me up a lot. But Happiest, I, I, I would say when I wake up in the morning, because I, I, I'm one of those people. I'm not used to be, but I spring out of bed because of the challenges that are lay ahead, and I love challenges. Just go, fuck it, let's go. I'm my fucking. I wake up, I'm not grumpy at all. I wake up, just fucking so happy, and I just hit it. What's your daily da daily routine like now compared to where it used to be? I. I the, the training routine from jail, I, I trained today, I used to train three hours a day in jail, I trained three hours a day out here, I walk 12 k's, I do weights, I try to eat healthy, but my work ethic is on another level. My People say your work ethic is a form of escapism, I don't know, I love that. And there's the old adage, you love the job you do, you'll never work a day in your life. Yeah. I love what I do. Mm -hmm. I just love interacting with people. I love the fact that all these people who went to fucking university for fucking 20 years or whatever they did for their law degrees and everything, and they're coming to me for advice. You know, they come to me with fucking some of these cases. How can we, because I've done, been involved in so many, do you know about this and you know about that? I'll say, this is how you do it, you know, because I'm, I've got a good understanding of law. Um, uh, so I'm interacting, my daily, I'll go to the gym, I go to this gym, it's like, the, it's a bloke from my area, he's got this really good gym. So I go there and the gym's like my family, everyone there, it's, it's like, you know, that's really warm when you know everyone at the gym and everyone's encouraging, everyone's positive and no one's there bagging and no one's envious and do a lot of social media stuff, sort of build a pretty big, or well, getting a pretty good platform going there and I love that because, you know, I, I can share my story and people are getting inspired by it. I love that, you know. I love when people say, you know, off, oh, you know, your your routine. I'm doing your routine. I'm doing the cold showers in the morning. It's a game changer and everything. I love being able to be a contributor. What's all your social medias and YouTube for people to get involved and maybe reach out to you for yeah. anything they need to ask? Russell Nancer official on uh, Instagram. Russell Nancer official on TikTok, which I just lost a massive account there. Um, and uh, Russell Nancer YouTube, yeah. Russell Nance on Facebook. I've got all that sort of stuff. I don't... I, I just keep it to that, man. Because it's, fuck, that's a full-time job, that social media. Yeah, that's a time bomb. Yeah. But you can get lost in that. Yeah, you can. Forget to forget to really live because it's... For me, it's, the more as time goes on, I'm realising it's fucking all bullshit, man. It is. I crave that because you think it's what makes you happy. They think that's what makes you uh, showing that you're succeeding and achieving. But it's just an electrical screen. Mm. 
pretending that you're fucking something that you're not really yeah. because it's fake as fuck but it's still handy because these stories will help others and other people mm. maybe come forward to then try and hear and change their life which is very important but how do you feel coming here today and kind of telling your story does it drain you brother no nah, no nah, it doesn't I, I, I was pumped for this one this is one of the it was a goal this podcast was a po- goal for about two years now i think and it's i love what you do i've loved who you had i know you've been you've interview, and, and your style of interviewing is really good good flow and um, i love how you and i sort of do a lot of your own like i i like i went with my podcast i sit back too like you like you do and let people do the talking yeah that's right yeah but um no i love it I, man i love i could do it again I, I could do it again anytime i just love traveling too i can sit on planes you know, people say it's sitting on a plane for sixteen hours. Sit on a fucking prison van. Sit on a fuck. <laughs> sit on a sit on a prison van for sixteen hours. You'll fucking know what's happening there. You know what I mean? Because yeah. in Australia, you go on some fucking van rides that'll take sixteen hours to get to where you're going, mm-hmm. and there's not a toilet in there. You know? Yeah. So I, I'm grateful, man. I can sit on a comfortable chair and a fucking even in the economy, it's fucking nothing. It's a walk in the park. Right. So for anybody that's part of those suicidal thoughts, what advice would you have for them? Man, hand up, reach out, man. Them suicidal thoughts, man. It's it's a permanent probably problem for a temporary, you know, it's a permanent solution for a temporary problem, you know what I mean? And, um, you know, look at them waves at the beach and their, their feelings and thoughts and they fucking, they come in and come out, you know what I mean? And I'm telling you, I'm glad that I fuck, I put mine off for 24 hours and it was the best decision I ever made because today I've got a life beyond my, well, you know, they say in recovery, be careful what you pray for you and just might get it and I got it, I got it in fucking droves, man. I've got this blessed life today. That man, I've got every cell of my body's full of fucking gratitude for what I've got today, and um, and I wouldn't have what I've got today if I fucking, you know, and, I, and, and you know, we've all got a chance to leave a legacy, yeah. Mm-hmm. We've all got a chance to leave a legacy, and fucking, you know, for me, that's all about. I'm gonna, I want to leave a good one, you know. I don't want to leave traumatized people behind, and and for me and anyone that are doing that sort of, you, know, you, you traumatize people that don't deserve it. They're not asking for it, you know. Uh-huh. Do you want to? Do you want to? Do you want to go now and end up your pain? Well, it's it's you're passing your pain on to someone else. That, what about this clothing brand as well? Proper. This is a good mate of mine. So, low key is a mate of mine who's um he's um he he's he, he's the one who opened my podcast up for me. And one day, he's big island, half Tongan, half Italian. He's but he's got the fucking Tongan bill, and he walks. Hey, hey brother, hey brother, um. Have you got a podcast? Have you been on a podcast as I've been on a few? He goes, brother, you should go on one yourself. And I said, how do I go on that? He said, oh, he gave me his phone number and he got me on. Like, I'm, I'm with a pretty big studio in Australia called Made in Katana. They do all real big. We've got a fucking TV studio. Unbelievable. And he got me on there. So, um, and this is his craving brand proper, you know, and it's all about, it's proper. You know, people I think there's that saying worldwide, when something's real, it's proper. You know, I think it really, fuck, it's a real Scottish word, proper, isn't it? Mm. Like, when something's fucking good, it's proper. So, yeah, so um, a rep for him. You know, I've got other clothing brands, but approach me, but I just love this guy. I love his story. And, you know, he, he's um, really prolific in the rap scene in Australia, which has fucking become a massive, you know. He's done really well for himself in business. Started off mower lawns, then bought barbershops, then nightclubs. All legit, all 100% legit. Now he's got, say, music entertainment. He's just done. So I'm doing a movie with him this year. I'm going to be an executive producer on a movie. So we're doing a true crime. We're just working out what it's going to be. And he's already done one called Neverland. Well, not the Michael Jackson one. It was a bunch of rappers that robbed a drug dealer and sort of stuff like that. So good. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so that's his brand. Get on proper streetwear on Instagram. Brother, listen, fascinating story. Fair play to you. Nothing but proud for you for everything that you've overcome, everything that you're achieving now. Would you like to finish up on anything else? Mate, I just, I'm just so grateful for you having me here, man. I'll tell you, it was the fucking best, what was it? It's about 28 hours of my life getting in. <laughs> no, no, look, anyone, you know, struggling that needs someone, mate, I, you know, if it's not, if I don't get to you, I've got people behind me. I've got a big team and, and someone, you know, reach out and we'll put you in contact with the right people if I can't do it myself. I'm going to actually next year be on a book tour, and so I'm actually get over here and back mate, when I can. And and mate, um, anyone fucking sees me on the street, come up and say hello. I love meeting people. I love it. I get a heaps in Australia, and get a heaps of that. And I love that sort of. If you can take a photo with someone and make that day, how good's that? Yeah, fucking that's the best. Two bro. minute fucking two minute investment that makes someone smile. I love it. It's all about that, man. If I can make people smile, if I can make a difference in their life, fuck, I've achieved my day. 
brother. Cheers, brother. Listen, wish you all the best for the future. Thank Enjoy you, my brother. Thank you very much. God bless you and keep going. Thank you, Jay. Cheers, bro.